the vote was 10 to 8. The chief, he's got his hand up. Look. No, Mr. McMurphy. When the meeting was adjourned, the vote was 9 to 9. Oh, come on. You're not going to say that now. You're not going to say that now. You're going to pull that hen house shit now. When the vote, the chief just voted, it was 10 to 9. Now, I want that television set turned on right now. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we are continuing our exploration of Milos Forman's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host in San Diego, California, voiceover artist, um, and excited to be jumping back into this movie for the second part, Steve. There's there's so much to be discussed about this, and I'm a little nervous. I'm actually a little bit afraid to discuss this um, movie because some of the feelings I have about the movie aren't the same as they were before. So I'm a little weird about it because I don't want people to think the outlaw has been domesticated, but I have a lot of feelings about this movie that are different than the way I've felt in the past. When you say before, do you mean like they've changed since our last recording or just no. since the last time you've seen it? Since the last time we've seen it. And I think I, I think I, as I re-listened to our first part, cause we're recording after we dropped the first part, I, I felt that maybe I I kind of didn't 100% commit to my actual feelings on it. And I wonder if I'll be able to do that as we talk about it today. I don't know. It, it's so funny that you say that because, you know, sometimes when we do two-parters, we record, sometimes mm-hmm. it's, we record one long session and divide it into two. And sometimes it's record part one. And a couple of days later, we do part two. Mm. This has been a while since we recorded part one. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a similar reaction, which I was like, mm. Man, I, did I did I really say what I felt at part one? Do I really yeah. did I really commit to it? And then I was kind of nervous, and went. I got to really reread my notes really carefully. <laughs> I don't know what what it is about this movie, but it, it's there's a lot here. Yes, it's very emotional, and it's also yeah. very ambiguous in a way. You know, a lot of ambiguity and ambiguity. And I almost tweeted this out, and then I hesitated. You know, because to be honest with you, <laughs> Twitter now is a cesspool. And it's scary to tweet any strong opinion. People just come after you, man. And yeah, I almost tweeted out today. Um, to be honest with you, I care about Chief's story much more than McMurphy's story in the in One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nests because to me, McMurphy helps the Chief for sure to find oh, his yeah. voice, to find his strength. But also, he's an unreliable criminal who is not who doesn't take responsibility for his actions. And I don't want to see him break out and go succeed. Chief breaking out at the end, walking off into the distance. In my mind, I like to think that he went back to his people, went back to his place, found a good woman, settled down. And this was just a memory of his years from now. And he has wonderful children. And he learned how to come to terms with what happened to his father, how to come to terms with why he needed to put himself in a place like this and and uh, found peace. And whereas McMurphy, I never felt like, I don't feel sympathy for McMurphy. Now, do I think it's extreme what they did to him at the end? Absolutely, and it shouldn't happen. But that being said, I think Chief is the one who I care about the most in the movie. You know, which so is weird because Mc Murphy was who I was gravitating to when I was younger. You know, um, so first of all, you just answered a question that I was going to pose near the end of the show, which came from <laughs> Paul Sevilla. No, nothing to be sorry about. Paul <laughs> Paul asks, my other question oh. is, what do you think happens to Chief Bromden after he smashed the window? Did he spend the rest of his life free? My image in my mind is exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah. is that he he does you know make it back to his people and mm-hmm. can remember this as a, a a moment in his life and tell his grandkids and you know yeah yeah um yeah I I have the exact same feeling I it's interesting that you bring that up about the chief because as as I told you it's yeah. his story in the book the whole yeah. book is narrated by the chief and so yeah. there's I think. Even though his part is so much smaller in the movie, yeah. Yeah. I think they nail it in a way to make us really feel his journey. They hit the big beats that they need to hit with him, and his performance fills in the rest, which right. I think is great. Yeah. Um. So, uh, let's just. Ju- I say we just jump back in. Yeah, let's do it. Sorry. Uh, where we had left off, <laughs> he'd failed to win the vote to to watch uh, the World Series, and then in this bizarre scene. McMurphy tries to lift that hydrotherapy console, which there's no way he can do it, and leaves the room saying, "Well, at least I tried, goddammit. it." Yeah, strong and, statement. 
Yeah. And then it's the next day and the orderlies are listening to the World Series and we are back in a group meeting. And this time, instead of Harding being the focus, the focus is on Billy. Did you tell the girl how you felt about her? Well, well, I went, went, went over to her house on Sunday afternoon and, and I brought, brought, brought her some flowers. And I love that even though Billy's talking, hmm. we see... Jack Nicholson and we see Nurse Ratchet are still so central to the way it's filmed. You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can tell how stressed Billy is by the stutters, mm-hmm. you know, and right now he's really stuttering. And there's this crazy moment because he says, I said, I, I said, Celia, will you marry me and then all the guys in the room laugh (laughs) and then billy looks at the guys laughing at him and then he laughs along with them laughing at him (laughs) is this have you seen have you seen this or felt this i've been this yeah sure i mean those are the things that you you know as, as i've said before i was bullied as a kid till I was 15, I was made to feel inadequate by the cooler kids till I was 15. And so laughing along with the people making fun of you or laughing at you, it's a defense mechanism. It's a way to kind of make sure they don't turn their ire onto you even more. And that's kind of what you see here in this moment. Oh, you know, it's either that or Billy's not really understanding what they're laughing at. So he's just as a, as a, as a impulse, he just laughs along so he can be part of the group that's desire to feel like he's part of a community because he does normally always feel like he's the oddball out. Um, I, I totally agree with that. And I want to uh, dig deeper on it, but, but now I want to actually ask you the question, what is the joke? What are they laughing at Billy for in this moment? That he's, um, you know, immediately going to marriage and that he, you know, that, that he's got, he's, he's jumping too far ahead just because a girl, he likes a girl. Like he does, he's not understanding there are levels to this. And even these guys who are a bit unstable understand at some level that there are levels to this, the, to the courting process or stages to the courting process that Billy is kind of ignoring here. And they're kind of making fun of him for being green about it, so to speak. You know, it's so funny. It's a totally small moment, but you, mm. the things you're saying is just making more come out for me because mm. the thing for me is I think you're exactly right. That is what they're laughing at. You're jumping the gun. Yeah, yeah. But that isn't necessarily what Billy thinks they're laughing at. Right. Because what he might be taking it as, and of course this is all speculation, but what he might be taking it as is imagine the ridiculousness of a loser like me thinking any girl would marry me. Maybe. Yeah. You know. It's totally possible. And and now to 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 the idea of uh, because this is weird thing, if someone makes a joke about you in public and everyone laughs, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you don't laugh and are offended, or, yeah. or even if you just stay calm and don't laugh, you are now an outsider. Mm-hmm. You have to laugh, particularly with dudes. This is definitely a thing. And it happens with women too, I'm sure. But like you can't to not laugh or to get offended is to show weakness. So the only thing to do is to laugh at yourself. And that shows strength. And I think that what's so weird that's happening with Billy is they're making fun of him in a way that's probably hurtful. Yeah. But he feels good being part of the group, being able to laugh at himself, you know? Yeah. And then... (laughs) Nurse Ratchet. Your mother told me that you never told her about it. And the reaction from Billy at the word mother is huge. Well, it works on two levels, right? Because A, this woman being connected to her mom is kind of a overwhelming thing for Billy. But also having a woman emasculate you in front of men, in front of your yep. friends or your whatever you want to say, the people who are in this boat with you. It's also that there's also that instinctual primal feeling of embarrassment in that situation as well, as well as the mother son thing. You also had in the woman man thing. And that's certainly what's operating through him in, in that moment. And it's a, a nice foreshadowing for what we're going to get later when she threatens to tell, she threatens to tell his mom about sleeping with the girl. Well, and I think all of that is true in, in a normal mother son relationship. I'm not sure that this is a normal mother son right. no, no, relationship. It, right. it feels and, weird. 
Yeah. Because she says, you know, she says, why didn't you tell her about it? And now Billy, the stutters have become so big. He can't, he can no longer speak. Yeah. Yeah. And then she asks, Billy, wasn't that the first time you tried to commit suicide? Yeah. It's great foreshadowing for what's coming. Yeah. It's so, this is the cruelty of nurse ratchet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the guise of like, oh, I'm trying to help you and I'm trying to support you. We're just, we're just, we're looking at your problems. It's like to bring up his suicide Mm -hmm. in this way. I think her, she knows that mom is a weapon to control Billy. Yeah. 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 And there, there's, it's so awful. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense or a thought of what the fuck is going on with Billy's mom? I don't think it's sexual, but I do think there are those relationships between mother and children, especially maybe during these times, even more so, where there's an unhealthy connection between mother and son. And especially when a mother has a weak son, there is this sense of preying on their sense of guilt and their sense of duty to her. And so they manipulate them. And at times it can be um, uh, malicious. Other times it's needy and desperate. But I think it's very much a control issue. So, um, and it could even be something like, I don't want you going out into the world because people are going to hurt you. Stay with me, stay with your mom, kind of like into the woods, you know, what she sings to her and stuff. And so I think that's what is operating uh, under the sur- surface here of everything. I don't think it's physical or sexual abuse. Yeah. I think it's, uh, but I do think it's psychological abuse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's belittling him and controlling him and you know, massive amounts of guilt and disapproval and yeah. all sorts of stuff. And I also don't think there's a dad in the picture. No, absolutely not. In fact, there might have been at the beginning and left. And so Billy, in essence, becomes the male figure she gloms onto and manipulates and twists, maybe to pay for what the dad did, or maybe because she has a desperate need to have a man around. And ladies well, and gentlemen, it- that does happen, you know, and especially back then. Well, and that's why McMurphy becomes important. Yes. A strong male figure. Yeah. And everyone looks up when she brings up suicide. And then Cheswick goes, oh, my God. I think it's the uh, I think Cheswick is upset at Billy's being opened up like this in front Mm -hmm. of the group. You know, Miss Ratchet, I'd like to ask you a question, please. Go ahead. Okay. uh, You know, if. uh, Billy doesn't feel like uh, talking. I mean, uh, why are you pressing him? Why why can't we go on to some new business? Huh? And I wrote down, Cheswick's a fucking hero. <laughs> I really think he is in in this weird. I mean, he's the he's the most fragile person. Yes, but he stands up for Harding when everyone's attacking Harding. Now he's standing up for Billy when Billy is being exposed to the group. Right, and then he and now he changes the subject. Mm-hmm. He brings us back to the World Series. A baseball game? You know, and I've never been to a baseball game, and, well, I think I'd like to see one. And well, that'd be good therapy, too, wouldn't it, Miss Ratchet? And, of course, I think it would be good therapy. You know, maybe it's because of the way we think of things today, but, like, sometimes having a nice time is good mm-hmm. therapy, you know? And uh, we have a, a new game today, I think, don't we, Mac? That's right, Chess, and we want a new vote on it, don't we? And Nurse Ratchet, with just knowing she holds all the cards, says, Would one more vote satisfy you, Mr. McMurphy? And once again, McMurphy puts his hand up. He's encouraging everyone else to put his hands up. And one by one, all of them do. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what do you think? What changed them? (sighs) Oh, well, look, it's a battle of wills. They're both wrong. This is what I came to, what I what I prefaced maybe a little bit clearer earlier. I think they're both at fault for everything that happens in this movie, both of them. Because McMurphy doesn't care about the individual nature of these people either. He cares as long as he can use them to get what he wants. He wants the World Series, so he goes person to person and yells at them and guilts them and berates them until they raise their hands. So what's that? There's no different to me than Nurse Ratchet um, berating them and belittling them uh, to get what she wants, which is their subservience. And so 
to me, this is where it becomes a battle of wills between them both. And neither one of them takes the actual care of the people into account when they're doing the things that they're doing. And so um, that's what I feel when I'm watching this scene. So yes, he gets the right amount of votes, but how many, I mean, can you verify that they understand what they're voting for? I bet he can't. And then, but then she, she changes the game on him at the end, which is how it is in this society. Sometimes the people in charge will move the goalposts. So I get the symbolism of this moment, but I also think McMurphy is, you know, one of these guys that is not the most, I don't know, is the purest protagonist, I guess. Well, he is definitely not a pure protagonist. Mm. He is not a good guy. No. You know, I, I think if we, you and I met McMurphy out at a bar one night, we would not want to hang out with McMurphy. I'd probably leave the bar. Yeah. I mean, and maybe as younger guys, we might've been more enthralled by him. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, it, here, here's, here's how I would put it. I, I have a slightly different interpretation from you. Sure. And this is, and this is how I would put it is that I, per, first of all, McMurphy's out for McMurphy. Mm -hmm. There's, is that, the difference I would say is that what he is doing, I actually think does have opportunities to help them. And we see that is that whereas what I see Nurse Ratchet doing is only cruel. I see no chance that it's going to help them at all. That's mm. the difference that I see. Okay. Um, uh, and the other thing I want to bring up is that I think they, the vote changes because he tried to move the water console. Because of oh, the horrible, okay. I think that's part of it. I think the horrible spot Ratchet puts Billy into par mm. is part of what changes their vote. And I think Cheswick changes their vote. You know, all three of those things. And everyone raises their hands. All right. That's it. I only count nine votes, Mr. McMurphy. <laughs> he only counts nine. <laughs> only nine. It's a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> there are 18 patients on this ward, Mr. McMurphy. Which she's known the whole time that she was going to, yeah. she had this in her back pocket. Yeah. And he, you know, and this is, it's just what you say. The society says, hey, if you play along with our rules, you're going to get what you want. And then you play along with your rules. Everyone shows up to vote. Everyone says, okay, we're going to get it. And no, you're not going to get it. But it's also because McMurphy's not smart enough. You've got to be one step ahead of society, which is not easy to do. No. If you really want to enact change, our greatest leaders. Greatest civil leaders, greatest uh, social leaders, people who've changed this country or changed the society have always thought one or two steps ahead of the people in power in order to counter uh, what they might do. So that's the difference. That's why McMurphy is so flawed here as someone trying to enact change in this movie. Yeah, because like this is why that you know idea of that, well, this is the institution of our society that we all live in mm -hmm. and the power is all stacked against us. You know, mm. it's so hard to make change. Yeah. Um, and, and so now McMurphy's going to go out, try to get out the vote. And he goes person by person to all of the, the guys. It's surprising me. He doesn't go to the chief first, except that that's the most dramatic choice. Yeah. And in the midst of him trying to get all these people and then finally going over to the chief, trying to get chief Bromden raise his hand, nurse ratchet adjourns the meeting. Yep. And McMurphy fails to get the chief to raise his hand. He turns around frustrated, and then with him not looking, Chief Bromden raises his hand. Yeah. Chief! The Chief! Ah! Chief! Nurse Ratchet! Nurse Ratchet, look! Look! The Chief put his hand up! The Chief put his hand up! Look, he voted! He thinks he's won. Mm -hmm. And the look from her through that window is scary. The Chief voted. Now, will you please turn the television set on? Mr. McMurphy... The meeting was adjourned and the vote was closed. But the vote was 10 to 8. The chief, he's got his hand up. Look. No, Mr. McMurphy. When the meeting was adjourned, the vote was 9 to 9. And you see the scariness of Jack Nicholson. Ah, oh, come on. You're not going to say that now. You're not going to say that now. You're going to pull that hen house shit now. When the vote, the chief just voted, it was 10 to 9. Now I want that television set turned on right now. That's what I'm saying to you. Both of them are scary in their own ways. Both of them. Both, her with authority, him with violence and anger and frustration and unresolved anger issues that will explode and cause harm to people. And so, like I said, it's just weird to watch these, this movie now because I can hear that, hear the common understanding of the movie 
on my shoulder going, but he's fighting for society. He's fighting against a person who's abusing power. And I'm like, yeah, but look at him. He's not someone you want to have in any kind of sense of power or to give any kind of, because he's the kind of guy that if you give an inch, he's going to take a mile. So if she had given him the World Series, the next it's like, put on TV all day. Let me watch what I want to watch. Put on a whole series. Put on Netflix. Let me binge Stranger Things. Like it would never end. And so that's the other side of this thing. So these are the things that I was thinking about as I was watching the movie constantly, because I know what the common understanding of this movie is. But the other side of me found much more, not sympathy, but much more understanding in the situation and for Ratchet and much more blame for McMurphy than I initially had when I was younger. So I hate Nurse Ratchet and I <laughs> always hate Nurse Ratchet. Fair enough. But I agree with you about yeah. McMurphy. And here's the thing. I have so many thoughts running through my head. It's interesting to yeah. me that this is Ken Kesey who forms the Merry Pranksters, which is one of the foundations of the hippie movement and the counterculture mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. Because is that what frequently happens and, and, you know, examples from the French Revolution and Pol Pot and all these or, or the Russian Revolution, all these places mm -hmm. where there is an oppressive system and the oppressive system is terrible. Yes, And then we have all these ideals and the people with all the ideals overthrow the oppressive system and create a horrible nightmare of a fucking system. Right, exactly. And, yes. and I just suddenly went, can you imagine the world where McMurphy is in charge? Yes. Hell no. Hell no. Terrible. Absolutely yeah. terrible. McMurphy only cares about himself. He only cares about his own pleasure. And, 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 and if he can bring other people along and they have a good time too, that's great for McMurphy. Yeah. That's totally fine. But he is not altruistic at all. No. Not in any way, and, shape, or form. Right. And the thing is, you know, you go back to the story of all those fights he got arrested for. Well, how, how many fights did he actually have that right. he didn't get arrested for? Yeah. My guess is it's probably 10 to 1. He and probably how many had 50 fights. Did he instigate? Exactly. But we're we're handed the fact that he's this, you know, rebellious guy. Well, and we have this one case of this 15 year old that he slept with and that yeah. he describes as totally eager. And does that story the truth? Yeah. You know, and know. how many other women are there? Yeah. You know, right. Like, yeah, McMurphy's not a good guy. Yep. He finally storms away, closes the, the window, sits down in front of the turned off TV. You could see his reflection on the TV screen. And he sits there for a moment, and then you could see the wheels turn. He has a thought, and he says, Ofax kicks. He delivers. It's up the middle. It's a base hit. Richardson is rounding first. He's going for second. The ball's in the deep right center. Davidson over in the corner. Cut the ball off. Here comes the throw. Richardson rounding first. He goes into second. He slides. He's in there. He's safe. It's and the then he proceeds to narrate the World Series game yeah. out of his head. Yeah. So I want to point out that this is not improv. And this is not in the script. Mm. This is what this is. Jack Nicholson might not look like he's a serious like actor who studies and works really, really hard because it's yeah. so natural with his performance. Right. Right. He does work really, really hard. He spent night after night after night going over the who were the actual players on the team in that year's World wow. Series, wow. going over their stats and putting together in his head the entire game That's and awesome. practiced it over and over and over again so he could come in and look like he made all this up. <laughs> and it is so rousing and it is so fun as one by one the other patients come over and they just buy into this game and they start cheering along with him. It's a lot of fly ball in England. And now they're having this moment. And of course, Nurse Ratchet watching the whole thing and seeing power taken away from her. It's an amazing sequence. Agreed. So one of the things that happens when you're working on a movie like this is sometimes people socially kind of fall into the characters that they have. And what that meant for this movie was there was the group mm -hmm. and then there was Louise Fletcher. And Louise Fletcher continually, they're all living at the same place. They're all there together. And she's continually feeling ostracized and treated like the villain. And, you know, oh. yeah, I mean, because that's. I guess that's what you did in the 70s, right? You made people feel that way about it in a movie, I guess. Well, and I, I don't even know if it was on purpose as much as like all the guys are hanging out together. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so she's getting a little bit more frustrated and she's like, look, I'm not Nurse Ratchet. You know, I could be a fun person too. So at one point in the middle of the group session when she's getting really frustrated, yeah, uh, she takes off her top and flashes the whole cast Whoa, and crew. Really? <laughs> yep. Wow. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think she became more part of the group after that. <laughs> well, it's a shame she had to do that in order to be part of the group, but I guess... I mean. She broke the ice how she could break the ice. Yep. You know, kind of let these guys know what the deal was. Yeah. Patron Tanner McGuire says, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is all about the constant battle between routine and chaos. Although you could argue there is some benefit to having routine in your life, it is clear that the authoritarian nurse Ratchet has pushed this to the point of being a detriment to many of the patients, which is why they are so won over by McMurphy's anarchistic, anarchistic nature. Mm-hmm. In your personal opinion, at what point does routine do more harm than good? And on the opposite end, do you think McMurphy's brand of chaos can be just as harmful to the patients of the ward as Nurse Ratchet's strict routine? God, I love that our fans see, and I was hesitant, yeah, to feel this way or speak about it this way because I was worried the fans would turn on me or turn on us. And and I, I I'm so glad to hear that question. Yeah, hundred percent. I think his stuff is just as detrimental. Mm-hmm. To Nurse Ratchet, and I don't go along with Steve. Like she's, and, and I, of course, I always respect Steve's point of view, but she's the knowledgeable one in the situation. She has the training. She understands therapy. She has the doctor's approval. So, would I side with Nurse Nurse Ratchet in a conversation between her and McMurphy? Probably more than I would anticipate, or than I would think. But in the end, I think McMurphy's more dangerous because there is no follow up to this moment of enjoyment great we all go we get to watch the ball game what happens afterwards right what, what's around okay what if the what if the ball game's tension and stress causes these guys to relapse what if the ball game is triggering what if these guys have daddy issues of going to ball games with their fathers and now their father's not around or their fathers used to beat them or sexually abuse them or whatever or maybe they were fondled at a ball game maybe they play little league baseball and they were terrible at it got made fun of and it triggers that so there's responsibilities here right and i think there's more to it than just Great, we get to watch the ball game. You know, uh, it can be therapeutic, but it can also be quite detrimental. We don't know. She, he would have to know all their case files in order to really think it was the right thing to do. Right, and so those are the things that I think I'd be, I'd be leaning towards in terms of looking at it all. But the first part of the question, routine and chaos, I am in a constant battle of that all the time. So because I know routine is important. But I also need to feel like I have my alone time, my own time, where I can do what I want. And sometimes I fuck with my routine by leaning into my chaos too much and going up until the last minute doing what I need to do because it's my way of rebelling. I still have that instinct inside of me, which is always a problem. So I would say as you get older, routine is much more important. Well, I can't even say that because routine is important to establish patterns when you're young so that you can succeed in life. But a little chaos is always good. Just finding where to have those moments of chaos, I think, is important. I, I think there's a balance, and that balance point is different for every person. Agreed. I mean, it's not, yeah, general. Yeah, you're right. There's not like a rule like, oh, chaos is bad and routine right. is good, or it's, you know, in my life, I, the way that I do my work is routine. You know, I try very hard to, do, you know, come up with the system, modify the system, make the system the best possible system and repeat the system over and over and get better at it. Right. That's routine. Yeah. You know, practicing martial arts, practicing the, those are routine things. You do them the same way you do them over and over again. Yeah. I've also gone to Burning Man. Yeah. Land of chaos. Mm-hmm. I love, I have friends who are far more chaotic than me <laughs> and that's good for me. You know, because they will get me to do, they will be McMurphy and they will get me to do things that maybe I wouldn't have done. And sometimes those friends are too chaotic and I have to be away from them or, or go like, oh, that was not a good choice. You know, I can't back you up on that. I think there's a balance to be found. And, and, and here's what I would say too, is that the question is, is it serving you? You know, like a lot of times, like you're doing the same routine, same routine, and you're not happy and it's not working for you. Right. Time to change that routine you know, mm-hmm. and the same is true with chaos. Like, you know, if, if you can't make, if you can't get your bills paid, well, yeah. then that chaotic lifestyle, man, that's probably not constructive anymore. Agreed. Agreed. It can lead to self-destruction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Which is why having, which I I really like that you brought up the polls, that these are the polls of McMurphy and Ratchet yeah, rather yeah. than the good guy and the enemy, you know. Um, we're in a meeting with the doctors. And I was going through my notes. This time I went, oh, at this moment, McMurphy still believes that he has 68 days and then he automatically gets released. Right. I think if he didn't, if he knew that that was not true, he would be very different in this scene. Mm-hmm. Cause the what he the first thing he says is, "Ah, oh, fucking nurse, man. What do you mean, sir? She um, she ain't honest." All the doctors in this room, by the way, are doctors from the hospital. <laughs> These are actors. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, now look, uh, Miss Ratchet's one of the finest nurses we've got in this institution. <laughs> well, I don't want to break up the meeting or nothing but she's something of a cunt ain't she doc it's really if you knew that you you were dependent upon these doctors to let you out you would not talk this way yeah yeah well you know i've uh, been observing you here now for the last four weeks and i don't see any evidence of mental illness at all and i think that you've been trying to put us on all this time and McMurphy kind of thinks, well, what do you want me to do? You know, and comes up with ways to act crazy to prove he's crazy. Yeah. How did you feel about what happened yesterday? Well, you want to kill. You know what I mean? And he gives this kind of crazy laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, again, saying that he was thinking of killing is not a way to get him released from this place. Right. I think he could have been sent back to jail. I think if he... If he handled this meeting differently, yeah. he would be alive. Billy would be alive. All of them would have survived. Probably. This. Probably, yeah. yeah. We're outside. Some of the guys are loading up into the bus. Other guys are starting a basketball game. McMurphy looks around. He looks at the barbed wire, looks up at this tree above, calls over the chief, and essentially climbs up the chief's back over the barbed wire to escape and jumps in the school bus and steals the bus with all the people in it. <laughs> So in the book, this isn't a stolen bus. It is, they have a vote to go on this fishing trip. That's McMurphy's idea. They, they win at the vote. And finally, Dr. Speedy actually joins them on the trip oh, and wow. pays the money necessary to actually rent the, the charter, the boat. So it happens very differently. It's yeah. not stealing the truck. Milos Foreman didn't want to do this whole sequence. Really? So, so here's, what's interesting to me years ago. With Jaws, I said that I thought one of the most brilliant things was that in the book, they go home every night on the Orca. And in the movie, Spielberg says, once they're out, they're out. Yeah. And then I brought this up recently because when we just did Misery, in the book, you never leave Paul and the house. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, Rob Reiner makes the choice, no, no, we should cut away to have our detective, you know, to have the sheriff and all that stuff. Right. Here, Milos Foreman, his belief was, we're in the hospital, we should never leave the hospital. Hmm. And it was Saul Zantz who said, now the sequence is in the book and says, no, no, you got to leave. This is, we need to do this. And they fought and fought and fought. And finally Saul said, you have to shoot this. I'm the producer of the movie. You have to go shoot this boat thing. And Milo said, fine, but I'm not going to put it in the movie. And of course, then they shot it and they put it in the movie. <laughs> hey, you know, it's a collaborative effort. Always. And it's a what? great break from having been in the ward the whole time because uh, an audience watching a film set in a, a mental ward for two hours, that's that's claustrophobic. So a little break, a little difference, a little break out, I think is a good way, a good thing to see in the film and at the right time when it happens. Well, and I think too, this thing we've been talking about, about who is McMurphy and is he a good guy? Mm. If you take this out of the movie, he is right. much less of a good guy. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You know, because this he clearly gives them something. Even just them driving through town and yes. just watching these people react to what they see. Yeah. Uh, and then we stop at this place and he brings a girl on the bus. And that is Candy, who's uh, Mar Maria Small. Mm -hmm. And the reactions from all these guys who haven't probably been around a, a, a available lady in a long time. Mm. Um and we pull up to where their charter boats are and they're all getting out. He's handing out the life jackets on this boat and up comes uh, the harbor manager. And the guy playing the harbor manager is a guy named Mel Lambert. And I want to tell you how he got on this movie. Okay. 
Mel Lambert is sitting next to Michael Douglas on an airplane and they're just chatting. And Michael Douglas finds out that this guy is a big used car salesman in Salem, Oregon. (laughs) And that one of the main clientele he has is he sells, he and his family sold to a lot of Native Americans. And so he has a lot of contacts with the Native American community. So Michael Douglas says, well, we're having a really hard time finding a really tall Native American to play Chief Bromden. Wow. So if you think of somebody, let me know. And he gives him like his card or something. And Mel Lambert's other hobby, in addition to selling used cars in Salem, Oregon, is that he is an announcer at local rodeos. That's awesome. And Will Sampson works rodeos. (laughs) So he calls up Michael Douglas four months later and says, I found the guy. And that is how Will Sampson gets on this movie. Wow. That's awesome. So their deal with Mel Lambert, used car salesman of Salem, Oregon, is we're going to give you a part in the film to thank you for finding Will Sampson. (laughs) But they don't give him a script. They say, you know what? You're just going to improvise this scene with Jack. So right before they start shooting, this is this is according to Mel Lambert, by the way. Uh, Jack walks up to him and says, I'm taking your boat. And Mel says that he, without missing a beat, looked at Jack Nichols and said, you take that boat, you little turkey, you're going to get the worst ass kicking you've ever had. And they just start arguing. And then they just bring the arguing in front of the camera. And that is what we see. Uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. What are you doing on this boat? We're going fishing. No, you're not going fishing. Not on this boat. You're not going fishing on this boat. Uh, method acting. You got to love it. Yep. And I love that 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 Jack introduces all of them as doctors. Yeah. It's, oh, oh, my God. And it's almost believable. Like, you could see it, right, from the way they look and the way they're dressed. Uh, it could You could possibly pa- get away with that excuse. It's so good. Well, the one person I think that doesn't pull it off a doctor is Dr. R.P. McMurphy. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's the only he one. looks the least like a doctor. Yeah. Whereas Scanlon with that huge beard, you know, kind of does. Cheswick totally looks like a doctor. Absolutely. Harding does. Yeah, Harding. Yeah, totally. Um, so, and then we were taking the boat out, and I love just, you know, Chris Lloyd <laughs> untying the boat and then slipping and hanging off of the edge of the boat as it sails out. Uh, that was Christopher Lloyd's idea, by the way. Oh, yeah. And we're sailing out in the ocean, and just the feeling of the world opening. It's just what you said. We've had all that claustrophobia, and yeah. it just opens up, you know. And he brings Cheswick up on the bridge and has him steer the boat, and Cheswick is panicking. I just hold it steady right there like that. Steady? Steady, yeah. Just, I just go straight. Straight as an arrow, Charlie. Straight, man? Just straight, that's right. But Mac, Mac, this thing ain't too steady, Mac. Mac! And then we have this whole sequence where he's having them bait up their hooks with the dead fish. Oh, yeah. So a couple things about this. First is they narrowly missed a, a huge storm. Oh, my when, God. Yeah, they, they 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 were supposed to go out on a day that this unexpected giant storm came in to the Oregon coast. Wow. Um, but they were so far behind that they ended up having to push two days. So they missed the giant storm. But that didn't mean that the water was nice and smooth and calm. <laughs> and this cast were not made of, of sailors. <laughs> yeah. And they're handling dead fish. Right. That don't smell good. It was a lot of vomit. There's a lot of seasickness, particularly apparently Danny DeVito and Christopher Lloyd were just puking this whole time. Oh, I think yeah. they shot for five days out on this boat. Um, there's one moment where Jack is doing a great performance. He's talking about baiting the hook, and I could swear he's about to puke. Like, it just, <laughs> there's just one moment where you see his face with that look. Oh. And it, I bet the director said cut, and he just puked, That's you hilarious. know. But it's really funny. Oh, and in the midst of all this, while we're doing all the hook baiting, Billy is talking or looking at candy. Yeah, yeah. And you, you um, got, 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 got beautiful, got beautiful hair. Thank you. And we just heard this story about him proposing to this other girl. I mean, clearly th- there's a parallel going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack grabs the girl. They head below decks. Everyone is out theoretically fishing. I love that Cheswick is f- in a, a terrified voice singing to himself. I'm <laughs> and martini looks back at where jack went and he goes to go look in the the window to watch whatever's going down and then all the other guys 
leave their you know rods and reels behind yeah. to go peek on Jack and Candy. So this is where I come back to, right? Because he, again, in this moment where you think he's, yeah, he, he breaks them out and takes them on the bus and then, you know, he, he picks up a woman. Okay. It's about him. Uh, then he, then he takes them out on the boat and yes, he's sweet with them. He teaches them how the bait tells Cheswick to drive the boat, which is pretty irresponsible since Cheswick's never driven a boat just so he can get a, a, a uh, underneath into the room and have sex with candy. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it's all about McMurphy and yes, these are sweet moments, but in the end it's all about McMurphy getting his needs met. And I think that's where the dangerous stuff lies with him. So, but it kind of taints the sweetness in my opinion for me, for me, for me. Well, I think you should take, I think you should take McMurphy's sweetness with a grain of salt. I do think yeah. he cares to various degrees, but it's all that carrying is all secondary to, he wants to have sex with candy mm-hmm. and, yeah, and, right, exactly. you know, well, and it's this thing I think we talked about in the first episode is he's following his pleasure his and his urges. Yeah. And sometimes those things that he's following line up with things that end up being good for other people, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes they don't. Yeah. So and I love the moment. So all of the guys have disappeared from the, you know, the aft of the boat and then Cheswick turns around and sees that everyone's gone. Hey, where did everyone go? <laughs> and then he yeah. just lets go of the wheel and the boat oh. starts going in circles. Yeah. This is a funny sequence. It's so funny. And then out comes Jack, you know, half yeah, dressed half going, what? God damn it. I told you. And then suddenly there's a fish on the line and they're all fighting to get the fish and there's total chaos. And then Harding goes up because he wants to take over driving the boat. And it's just, it's really fun. But, and I know, I know, I know our fans get so mad at me sometimes. There's great symbolism here. This is what it would be like. You referenced this earlier, Steve. This is what it would be like if McMurphy ran the world. Oh, yeah. It would be utter chaos. It would be him trying to get his needs met. Um, he, they'd get distracted by a big fish because that's probably them bringing in new people into the movement or new money into the movement. But whoever's driving the boat, he's just letting whoever drive the boat. And then other people are fighting to drive the boat to be the person who's kind of in, in, considered to be the head of the of the movement or whatever. So there's so much here that is in, involved in what it's like for McMurphy if he was ever in charge of anything. And I think it's a great little, if you're looking for it, it's a great little difference between how he would run things and how a nurse ratchet runs things. Well, again, so many thoughts. <laughs> a, it's definitely more fun in this world than it was in nurse ratchets group session. You know oh, what yeah, I mean? No there, there's definitely more fun and it is also total chaos. And so it's funny. Yeah. So to, Two things I'll try to bring them up quickly um, okay. is on the Star Trek show. One of the themes that's come up now many times, particularly in the first season, is that in this weird way, Star Trek, the original series, is the World War II generation, the co- so-called greatest generation. Right, right. Which right. is Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn and a lot of the writers and the producers talking to the baby boomer generation that are the teenagers coming up in the, in the mid-late six, mid, 60s. And that... There's this, and that is exactly what we're talking about here, which is there's the World War II generation who is serious, who knows how to get stuff done, who cares about building strong institutions and what is the process and making money and making real things. And there's the baby boomers who go, this is all bullshit. We won't reject (laughs) all this. Like we should be able to be free. All of your institutions are crushing our spirits. And so you have the 60s, you have the hippie movement. Right. And my opinion is that we need both, you know. It, like and I and I just remember having there was a good friend of mine who had a theater company in Berkeley, and the basic theme it was it was almost all actors, and it was we're going to decide everything together, and it's all going to be a group, and we're all going to be a unit, and we're going to do it. It's not going to be a single leader who's telling people what to do. All of us together are going to make these decisions. And I remember I was sort of uh, like a junior member of the group at this time, and oh. I just remember like no someone's got to make decisions like you can't like a bunch of actors who i love actors yeah yeah 15 actors sitting in a room trying to decide what play to do and how to do it was cheswick letting go of the steering wheel and the yep. boat going in fucking circles yep exactly you know because everyone left <laughs> yeah well and everyone is absolutely certain that their way is the right way right. and everyone's trying to make it okay and everybody's trying to collaborate and it's like no somebody has to point in a direction and say that's where we're going at a certain point, you know, or to somebody's, you know, 
you, <laughs> things need structure. Oh, of course, sir, sir. Um, so, <laughs> but the sequence is totally fun and totally joyful. And then we cut to this shot of all of these people on shore watching yeah. as this boat is coming back <laughs> in, including a bunch of police. So good, man. And, and you see all of them, they have, they caught a bunch of fish and they're all yeah. smiling. Yeah. They're all happy. Yeah. I think this was absolutely therapeutic for all of them. But the other thing is that, and I think this is a crime and I understand okay. probably why it happened in the book, chief yeah. Bromden's on the boat and here oh, he's not. Right. And it stays it, back. It, That's right. Yeah. Well, and the reason is, is because in the book, they all agreed to go on the trip. It was a sanctioned trip. Gotcha. And in this, McMurphy steals the bus with all of the people that are voluntary that were already on the bus. And Chief isn't voluntary, so he's not on the bus. Right on. But it's such a huge thing, you know, because the story of the Chief is when you meet him, he talks about what a small person he is. He's a tiny, tiny person yeah. that his hand gets lost in McMurphy's hand because that's the image he has of himself. And in the course of the book, he grows in his own mind. And the boat is one of the key, key sequences that helps him grow. Yeah, yeah. And now we're back having a meeting with those doctors. And they're talking about whether or not he's crazy or whether he's dangerous yeah. or sick. Well, John, what do you want to do with him? I think we've had our turn. I'd like to send him back to the uh, work farm, frankly. And then we see that the other person sitting on this meeting is Nurse Ratchet. Well, gentlemen, in my opinion, if we send him back to Pendleton or we send him up to Disturbed, it's just one more way of passing on our problem to somebody else. You know, we don't like to do that. So I'd like to keep him on the ward. I think we can help him. What do you think? Steve Morris, do you believe her? No. Wow. Okay. Do, okay, like, let, me, let, me frame, let me say that a little bit differently. <laughs> Do I believe that some part of her thinks that she can help him? Yes, I do believe that. Okay. Do I believe that is her real motivation? Absolutely not. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. What do you think? It's tough. I think because the, the the comment is still a comment that we hear nowadays, don't we, in our political discourse. We don't want to pass it off to someone else. Deal with it here. Deal with it here. We don't want to pass it on to our children or pass it on. To, we don't want to kick the buck uh, down the road or, or kick the problem down the road. So I think her logic is sound. Sure. But I don't 100% think that she understands what she's walking into. So I think there is a, a majority of her thinks that it is the right thing to do to try to cure him to try to heal him or whatever. And there's maybe even professional pride in the fact that she would be able to convert him and turn him or what have you. So there's an element of that in my mind. I don't see her as malicious as she has typically been set out to be in previous analysis of this movie. I think there's more to what she's doing. And cause that's an incredible job by Louise Fletcher as the actress playing the role there's much more going on in her eyes and in her mouth than you think like there's something about the way she moves her lips in certain moments and her eyes in certain moments that you're just like oh there's something more going on here and so i don't 100 percent think that she's you know just wanting to take away his independence and step on him like he's a bug i think there's some kind of curiosity professional curiosity and it, it's her belief that we should handle problems right at the source i think that she is part of the institution. Mm -hmm. And I think that she believes, I do think she believes that the institution is doing good. Yeah. And that she is serving a good by being part of the institution. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's a lot, and you, you will hear about this in people talk about this in police work of, of like how much, how much is dominance and power, a, yeah. you know, part of law enforcement that you can't let this other side think they can push you around, right. you know? And that, uh, and that some people need power to be asserted over them in order to do the right thing. That if they're left to their own devices, they're going to be chaotic. Right. And which is true of McMurphy. That's exactly yeah. what we've been talking about. Yep. So the idea that I need to keep him down or break him down or break all of these men down is that in order to get them to conform, 
-hmm. And that in the long run, conforming to what society wants you to be is going to be a good thing. And so I think in that sense, she totally thinks that this is going to be a good thing. But we never see any scene where she says, I'm going to conform them. I'm going to break them. I'm going to make them feel this way. Or, you know, if you're looking at it from the outside, it looks like she legitimately wants to get these people to confront their issues. Now, you can argue her tactics, certainly. And when we find out that everyone is there voluntarily, that makes it even more of an interesting situation for how she's doing what she's doing. But the conforming is to be able to make help you function normally in society, what we typically dis- right. typify as normal, quote unquote, you know. And I think there is an element of that here, bigger than I think people give her credit for in previous interpretations of the movie. I think I want my own eye, maybe. <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm on a peninsula near your island. I'm on Hayward <laughs> Island again, but with the full <laughs> nurse Ratchet. I'm on Ratchet Island. There we go. Yes. Um, I think that there is a certain point where people servicing institutions that are not servicing the people they're supposed to service is bad. I agree. But here's the deal. How does she represent the institution when even the doctors in the institution are considering sending him back? That's the thing. They're not all of one mindset. There are multiple opinions in that room. And so to me, I don't know that she represents the institution singularly, singularly. I think she represents her part in the institution and she wants to play her part in the institution and wants the permission to do so from these doctors. Well, the other thing too, yeah. and this is, is that we are not good at pulling our own emotional feelings about a particular thing out of our decision-making process. Right. Uh, I oh, also good, very think, good. Very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also think she fucking hates McMurphy. She really? Hey, where are you? Absolutely. Tell me where you're getting that from. I from her facial expressions when she watches him, okay. from the way that he's combative, combative with her, that right. she sees him as someone who's questioning her authority. Yes. I mean, I, I, I definitely think she is. Doesn't so he's like coming her. into her right. situation. Yes. Fucking it all up at his ex- at whatever he wants to do, and somehow fucking it all up in her mind. Yes. To be mad at her at her at well, him. If uh, someone came into your house, started tearing shit up, and started questioning how you were parenting Jax, that might not sit so well with you. Well, certainly, I don't know what this person is doing in my house. If someone <laughs> is coming into my business where I'm supposed to help people with issues, well, and the thing too is that yeah, I yeah. think the I think the ward would have been better off if they had watched the fucking World Series. I think the ward would have been enough if they had left McMurphy in a fucking prison. That's what I don't think so. I well, I think I mean depending depending. I think Billy. If Nurse Ratchet doesn't do to him what she does to him at the end of the movie yeah. is way better off because McMurphy was here. I think Billy Billy is way better off. McMurphy doesn't force him to have sex with that woman. So that's what I'm telling right. you. To me, well, let's we'll get to that. Both, we'll get to that later. They're both guilty, in my opinion. But anyway, go um, ahead. so but <laughs> this is why this is a great fucking movie, yeah. and this is why why this is a '70s movie. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm I mean? Hundred percent. It's like we're not going to film. Yeah. Yeah. Like you and I uh, might love wrath of Khan or back to the future, but yeah. we're not going to have arguments like this about, no. you know, about what Marty McFly really, what, you know, it's like, no, there's nothing to argue about. It's back to the not future. attacking systemic injustices. In <laughs> no, the exactly. Yeah. Um, in complex ways. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have chief Bromden on the boat, but we do have the chief on the basketball court. And at first, McMurphy's just trying to get him to have his hands up, and they start playing against the the orderlies who are beating them. And yeah. then McMurphy passes to the chief. The chief catches the ball, and he puts it in the basket. Hey, baby, put it in! And watching Will Sampson's walk to the yeah. other side of the court, the pride in it and the size of it is just so fucking joyful, you know? And then he totally goaltends the next basket. I mean, pushes it up through. <laughs> and then he smiles as he runs now back yeah. to, to onto offense. So good. It, well, and this is the thing about this movie. When it's fun, it is really, really fun. Agreed. Agreed. Which yeah. is what makes the drama all the more yeah. um, effective, for sure. So, and then we cut to another scene where all of the actors had a great time because they're all in this pool, which is like a giant hot tub. <laughs> and they're all playing around. 
And one of the orderlies who's Washington, I think, who's a theater, well-known theater actor, uh-huh. uh, po- kind of pokes McMurphy, who's hanging on the wall with like a cane. Yeah. And McMurphy says, I'll be seeing you on the outside. You know what I mean? By the time you get out of here, you'll be too old to even get it up. 68 days, buddy. And this is when he finds out. What the fuck you talking about 68 days? That's in jail, sucker. I still don't know where you at. Yeah, where am I at, Washington? With us, baby. You're with us. And you're going to stay with us until we let you go. You brought this up in part one, and I wanted Mm. to come back to it here, which is it is not an accident that the guys that work for Nurse Ratchet that create control are all African-Americans. Right. Okay. And one of the things that I think Kesey talks about, because a lot of this is about institutions and institutionalization, is how the power structure uses minorities to control other minorities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To keep order. Of course. You know. Yeah. I mean, this is something you, those of us in the communities of color talk about all the time, this idea of a a, a white majority or a, a... you know, in the situation, a white power structure seeks costly to create division between people of color and the communities of color um, in order to keep them from coming together uh, and possibly being of one mind in changing things. And I think that's that's on purpose. And certainly we've seen from Tuskegee Airmen, uh, to, I'm sorry, from the T- Tuskegee experiment to, um, you know, the rumors about how AIDS was put into the black communities. There's There's all kinds of stuff of how communities of color have been subject to abuses by government, by a, a white power structure government. And so it, it's their mistrust and suspicion that caused COVID vaccines to be so slow to be accepted within communities of color. And so there's a history. And so this idea of using one set of minorities in order to subjugate another set of minorities is true. And we see it in all. Like I just finished watching Emancipation and I don't want to ruin anything about the movie, but there's a, a black person who's in charge of some of the slaves and what he does or not in charge, but over some of the slaves and what he does, there's an altercation about that, a conversation about that. Um, and we, we know this and I want to tread very lightly here, but we know this in other situations where, um, ethnicities have been, you know, taken and seen as, uh, terrible people and other people within the ethnicity are put in charge and carry out, justice in worse ways than the people who put them in that situation. So we see that happening all the time. The usage of, you know, communities of color or com- people within the same communities to subjugate others because of the white power structure. And it's, uh, it's unsettling when you see it, you know, and by the way, I want to make this really clear. It does not mean that if it was all like, if it doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen the other way, we don't know, right? We don't know. Would, what would the world be like? Or what would the country be like if it was, you know, majority black people in charge, majority Latinos in charge. We don't know what that would look like in the future. So, but I, so I'm only speaking about what is occurring or what has occurred in our country based on the evidence that we've experienced over decades in our country. So, well, just to your last point, in my opinion is that people are people and yeah, that right. the, exactly. the, the, these ideas, you know, you've heard me say it before and someday mm-hmm. we'll have a long conversation about it, but <laughs> this whole race thing isn't real, you know, and right, that you, right, you, right. you know, you put a bunch of people in charge and you give them a lot of power. Well, they're going to behave the way they're going to behave. They're human you know, beings. Yeah. They're right. human beings. 100%. Um, I, well, and the other one, the other example I'd bring up is that, that you had, you know, before we define races the way we did today, it used to be that the Irish and Italian were not considered white. Jews like me were mm. not considered white. Yeah. And that Irish cops who were not give there were all sorts of places where Irish people were not accepted, Catholics right. were not accepted, and Irish cops were all over the East Coast, were part of the power structure over other minorities. Yeah. Other immigrants so, too. So it was their way to get power was to become part of the power structure as the enforcing arm. Right. Right. Of a group that wasn't accepting them, you right. know, which is what you see here in the in the film, Steve. Exactly. Which is so interesting. Yeah, I'd like to know why none of the guys never told me that you, Miss Ratchet, and the doctors could keep me here till you're good and ready to turn me loose. Do you think that the the other patients did this on purpose? Do you think they thought about this and purposely didn't tell them? No, I don't think. Yeah, no, I don't either. I, I don't, yeah, I, you know, I don't think it would even occur to them. Would anyone care to answer, Mr. McMurphy? 
Answer what? You heard me, Harding. You let me go on hassling Nurse Ratchet here, knowing how much I had to lose, and you never told me nothing. Now, Mac, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't know anything about uh, how much. Think... Wait a minute. Shit. Now listen. I, I... Now look. I'm I'm voluntary here. See, I'm not committed. This is dude. This scene is so good. I totally forgotten about this scene. So watching it in the movie this time around, I was like, oh, that's right. What a great little element to throw in there because it makes it even worse that you're choosing to be a part of this situation. So in essence, as we are, what this uh, obviously the book was a commentary on our society. People are choosing to be a part of this society. Exactly. You could leave and go to another country. You can go someplace else if you wanted to really get out of this situation, but you are choosing for the most part to be part of this society. Well, the line where he says, Jesus, I mean, you guys do nothing but complain about how you can't stand it in this place here, and then you haven't got the guts just to walk out. Don't, don't you see that in life, though, Steve, from people who just constantly complain about a situation that they're in, and yes. then you go, well, do this. You can do this. You can do that. No, no. I just want to complain about it. And it's like, well, why, why don't you want to change it? What is it about it that you can't change? And it's because people fear change most of the time more than they fear the routine that they have. You know, people fear the chaos of change over, uh, more than they fear the routine. You know, they'd rather bitch. There's a comfort in bitching about it because at least it's always there than there is in in actually breaking out from it. You know, and I was it's, sure. We, I think we're all guilty of it all the time. I mean, yeah. one of the great advantages of society and is that even if it's horrible and we hate it, is we know what we're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. We know our place. Yes. I, I'm supposed to do this and have this job and pay these taxes and save up my money and get health insurance and I'm supposed to do that. And eventually I'm going to look to retire. All these things is like, that's what I'm supposed to get, you know, all, have the kids and all that stuff. Yeah. When you take that away, well, then it's like, okay, what are you going to do? It's up to you. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. And I, and I think too, there is a reason that Ken Kesey is one of the fathers of the counterculture movement. Yeah. What is the counterculture movement? But saying, we don't have to live that way. Yeah. You know, we don't yeah. have to buy into the institutions. Exactly. And the thing is, and Steve, like, you, you know, I, I, the last six months I, w I was at Kaleida where the, I hated it, bitched about it every day. Lindley, the lady Allo, she'll tell you, I bitched about it every day. I was so unfulfilled. I was so marginalized. I was so frustrated being there, having to stand in line behind everybody, have them dole out things. Have, sit there like Oliver with the with the with the plate out. Please, sir, can I review this movie? Please, sir, can I react to this trailer? You know, all yeah. of that kind of stuff. And yes, they gave me more to do, but it still felt like, in terms of the sports and all that. But it still felt like the big things that I wanted to do, I wasn't getting, and I wasn't getting the chance. And so you could feel that, you know. And they weren't letting me write, and I was just constantly complaining about it. And she'd be like, "Well, why don't you go out on your own? Why don't you go this?" And I didn't, and I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it until I was forced to do it by them letting me go. And that, that was the crazy part of it all. And I've never been happier. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's got its own stresses, but I've never been happier. And so the fear of not being able to do this thing that I was so, uh, you know, in the system of doing was more powerful for me than the possible, than grasping the possibilities of a future that could be much more fulfilling. You know, so it's, it's always, you just are always caught in that sometimes when you're confronting change and you're frustrated about a situation. I, I was trying to figure out if I could say what percentage I think is people that feel totally trapped and don't know how to get out of the thing that they're in. Mm. I don't know what that percentage is, but it's pretty high. And I've yeah. spoken to a lot of people, people who've been in a 40 year marriage that makes them miserable. People <laughs> that, you know, hate their jobs. Right. What do you think you are, for Christ's sake? Crazy or something? Mm. Well, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're no crazier than the average asshole out walking around on the streets, and that's it. Do you think that's true? Oh, yeah. I think he was absolutely... He's got a functional crazy, right? The people who are in there, I think they have a... a diagnosable, unstable, or mental health situation. He's just angry at the world and rebelling and but it doesn't mean that there isn't an element of that in there but he could function in society if he really wanted to he, he could make it but his impulses are there to rebel against it but he's saying that about them he's saying that billy and cheswick and all of them aren't any crazier than the people out in the world oh i thought he was talking about himself in that moment 
that he's like raging at them, but mm. he's really talking about himself. That's how I mm. took it. Oh, that's an interpretation I'd never thought of. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought he's talking about them. No. Yeah. No, because he, see, I think he's yelling at himself. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. I just, in that moment, I this time know. around, I'm rather watching it. I felt like he was using them to yell at himself. Like there's a part of him that understands these things that he's doing. Um, he is playing at a certain role so he could be considered a certain way. But in fact, he could function because there's no way any rational person looks at those guys and, and goes, they can function in the real world. Cheswick cannot function in the real world. Billy can't function in the real world. Uh, no way. I mean, Christopher Lloyd's character, no way. Like they... There has to be, you know, there has to be time taken to really get them back into a, a certain spot, you know. I think it's it's so hard because but you might be. Right. People, I'm sure you're probably right. I'm just this is what I took it. Yeah, I think that they are cl- all close to being able to function in the normal world. Like mm-hmm. Billy, we see this brief moment later on where he, I think he could function. That moment is very very brief. I think Harding could function. I think. You know, like it's it's so interesting because right now we're in this moment of in New York City, the mm-hmm. mayor oh, yeah. just made this decision of forcibly taking people with mental health problems off the street. Mm-hmm. And we're dealing today, and part of it is a result of things that started happening in the late 60s, yeah. where a lot of these mental institutions were disbanded and people were kicked out and they found their way on the street. And there's yeah. some high percentage of the homeless population that are people dealing with severe mental health issues. And the question of well, should, are they better off where they are or should we force them into an institution? Like, what do we, th- these are very difficult questions. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I, and that's the thing. That's why I can't even begin to wrap my head around what he did. Cause I, I have so many different thoughts. Those are very challenging observations you made, Randall. I'm sure some of the men would like to comment. So she's expecting them to talk about this mm. and Scanlon who's barely talked, I think in this whole movie yeah. says, I want to know why the dorm is locked in the daytime and on weekends. And then Cheswick wants to know about his cigarettes. May I have my cigarettes, please, Miss Ratchet? You sit down, Mr. Cheswick, and wait your turn. Apparently, standing up in group session is definitely against the rules. Hmm. McMurphy has been running a casino and taking all of your cigarettes and a lot of your money. That's why we're rationing the cigarettes. Is she telling the truth? Yes, of course. Absolutely. McMurphy is taking advantage of these people who have mental health issues uh, and taking their money from them. Uh, And I think that's a terrible thing to do. But I also think infantilizing these people and saying you can't control when you get a cigarette or where you can go is part of what's bad for their mental health. It's it's an interesting line to walk us. Is she infantilizing them or does she, has there been experiences in the past where she's given them what they want and they've been worse or they've freaked out, or they've it, they've been irresponsible with it. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't oh, know. totally. Because I'm not obviously I'm not a mental health expert, but so I, I wonder if you know there's something about slowly giving them what they want, slowly taking it step by step, so that they don't go too far. You know, certainly all of them show impulses throughout the movie of going too far in certain moments. But I don't know. You know, oh, the, these questions, the one you just brought up about mm. like if you give them some room and they go too far and, or do you infantilize them and control them too much? And yeah, I have an 11 year old son. Mm. Karen and I deal with this all the time all because he's not that responsible and we want him to be responsible. And the only way to train him to be responsible is to give him responsibilities, but he's not very trustworthy. And so we're constantly going like, how much room do we give him hoping he'll make the right decision? And how much do we control him to protect him from making the wrong decision? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's stuff going on all the time. It's really, really difficult. (laughs) And this, this moment, and I, and I think it parallels what's happening here. Like her response to Scanlon about the dorm is she says, Remember, Mr. Scanlon, we've discussed many times that time spent in the company of others is very therapeutic, while time spent brooding alone only increases a feeling of separation. Now, you remember that, don't you? Do you mean to say it's sick to want to be off by yourself? Mm, Good counter. I think it's a great counter. Yeah, yeah. And I also think it goes to the institution has a one size fits all way of trying to solve these people's problems and humans are not one size fits all. Yeah. 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 If no, you but- forced me to be in a group in a public place all day, every day, and then locked me up in a room at night, that would not be good for my mental health. <laughs> that would be terrible. Really not. And Cheswick keeps going back to the cigarettes and he's getting more 
and more upset. I want my cigarettes, Miss Ratched. I want my cigarettes. But you're saying infantilizing, but here he is acting like an infant. He's acting like a child. Yeah, absolutely. So is that it learned totally behavior? Is. Or is that something he had from the beginning? I don't know. But taking away his cigarettes is making Cheswick have this breakdown. Yeah. You know, so it's like, I, it, it is a very, well, this is why, again, this is why it's a great movie. It is a very, <laughs> very difficult question. True. Um, his freak out is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Cheswick, you sit down. Give him a cigarette, will you, Harding? My last one. That's a fucking lie. Why don't you give him a cigarette? Well, look, I'm not running a charity award. So. Uh, the actor playing Harding is William Redfield. Mm-hmm. And about halfway through the shoot, he start, he gets like a cold. And the cold isn't really going away. And he's coughing a lot. And fortunately, they're literally in a hospital. And one of the heads of the hospital is acting in the movie with them, which is the guy playing Dr. Speedy. So he examines him. And we find out that William Redfield has leukemia. Oh, no. Yeah. And that it is advanced and very, very serious. And the guy, Dr. Brooks, I think his name is, who's playing Dr. Spivey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically says, I think he's got about 18 months to live. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And they're halfway through the shoot. And now the question is, I mean, the guy's sick. Yeah. Do they recast him? What are they going to do? And they go to William Redfield and talk to him about it. Like, how do you feel? What do you want to do? And he basically says, this is the best part I've ever had in a movie. Yeah. Let me finish it. Let me finish. Right. Of course. And so they finished the film and basically he did die 18 months later. Wow. Just and and lived just long enough to make it to the big premiere and see the movie. I don't think he lived long enough to make it to the Oscars. I got to respect it, uh, to be honest with you. You fight to the end, you know, and you want to leave some kind of legacy or leave some kind of calling card and if it's the greatest role you ever got at least in that way you're like i don't know you're just saying goodbye to the art that you loved so much you know the craft i i so get it i mean like this is a guy you and i have known so many people like him who are working actors and they're doing theater and they're getting by and they're probably having trouble making rent and they probably had years they didn't get insurance right and now you get this one big part in this important powerful movie yeah and finding out that you got 18 months left yeah it's like rain on your wedding day <laughs> come on y'all can't be the, it's not too soon for god's sakes he's been dead for quite some time we can make a little bit of a joke but i do i do appreciate this and look i mean i'm one of Dude, those i'm still people. laughing at that joke <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> that's, that's i'm true. one of these fatalists that's that you know it's like we're all gonna die everybody like it's a, we're all gonna die it's okay we've gotta you know kind of relax about this kind of stuff honor the legacy but also you know, have a little fun as well. And I think this is, I think, I think he'd probably appreciate the joke as well. Cause we've been lauding him throughout the whole podcast to his performance. Oh, he's great. Role. He's so good in that role, you know, and he was one of these guys and who knows what the future would have held for him. You know, we saw what happened with Christopher Lloyd, with Danny DeVito. We saw what happened with a number of these people at the beginning, Vincent Scavelli at the beginnings here, who knows what would have been his future, maybe sitcom stuff or a constant working character actor like M. Emmett Walsh or J.T. Walsh, who of course sadly passed early as well, but like could have lived a, quite a long life playing all these roles. But I mean, if you're going to go out, go out in one of the best films ever made, you know? I just want to go back to your joke. And the reason I want to go back to it <laughs> is because this is the thing about this movie and yeah. films of the seventies and the way we thought about things in the seventies that we're not thinking about now. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of humor comes right out of pain mm-hmm. and oh, some of the totally. funniest things in the world come out of the most painful things in the world. Yeah. And today we're kind of like, Hey, Hey, we can't laugh about anything that's painful. And it's like, well then how do I get past the pain? Exactly. You know? Yeah. And, and the thing is this movie is fun. And it mm-hmm. is funny mm-hmm. and it, and it's even funny in ways that are uncomfortable and difficult because some rough stuff going on in this yeah. film, okay. you know? And then the other thing that's happened, cause we've seen cigarettes getting lit and cigarette got flicked away is that one of the cigarettes happens up in Tabor, Christopher Lloyd's like the cuff of his pants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this apparently this happened to Milos Foreman, uh, where he got a cigarette in the cuff of his pants when he was in Czechoslovakia and his leg caught on fire and he freaked out. 
And that's where this comes from. Really? And so we have the building, like we know something bad's going to happen. Cheswick <laughs> is getting crazier and crazier. The orderlies are coming closer to re- restrain Cheswick. And Tabor freaks out, starts screaming. They grab yeah. him away. That only escalates Cheswick, who goes, I know little kid. You said I ain't no little kid. Where you're going to have cigarettes kept for me like cookies. Ain't that right? That's right. Now will you sit down? No, I won't. I won't. I want something to So here's a little behind the scenes bit. Please. The actor playing Cheswick, Sidney Lasik, who I think is brilliant in this movie. Yeah, he's great. He was on the edge. For real. I mean, he's living in this mental institution. He's spending all day with the patients, all day really in this character. They're not breaking character at lunch. They're like right. in these characters. And Dr. Brooks, who plays Dr. Spivey, <laughs> comes up and says to, to Milos, Michael Douglas, and Saul Zance, look, yeah. I know you're worried about Cheswick. I can see why. If he really loses it, I've already have the right medication for him and we can take <laughs> care of him. <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> right uh <laughs> just in case he's in good hands <laughs> and as the insanity of this scene is building mcmurphy gets up walks to the nurse's station punches through the glass and grabs the cigarettes and gives them to cheswick right. and the orderlies grab McMurphy and he punches them and there's a struggle and then up comes the chief and lifts one of those orderlies off of him. Yeah. Oh my God. And it's scary too, the kind of, which is a really well acted scene. It's scary. The kind of power the chief possesses. Yep. Right? And more orderlies appear and McMurphy is fighting and they restrain them all. And Milos Foreman says that this is what he grew up with in Czechoslovakia. Wow. He says, this is the institution of the state and learning to live with it or fight against it, and continually, when you fight back, being broken down by the institution. Yeah. And the other thing he said is that because the institution is so strong, sometimes the way you fight back is just in completely crazy and meaningless and stupid ways. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, because you have no. It's a yeah. It's a wilding out, so to speak, because you have you really have no other means to rebel against the situation. So yeah, that's a great point he makes cheswick the chief and mcmurphy are all in restraints and they're all sitting in this different ward and this is we're on the disturbed floor and the first person they're going to take away is mr cheswick Ugh. and all of the the people here the nurses the orderlies the doctors these are all just people who work in the hospital wow. this is this is what they do wow and so they're literally telling them just respond to cheswick as you would respond to a patient so this is kind of all an improv. Jesus Christ. No! Nobody's going to hurt you. Come on. No! It'll be all right, kid. Come on. No! You're all right. No one's going to hurt you. No! Leave me! No! Make it easy on yourself. No! Come on. Oh, Come on. No! And it's just sobbing and screaming and begging McMurphy as they drag him away. I did two steps in back! No! It's so sad. Yeah, but like you said, father figure type situations, McMurphy taking the place of, um, in essence, Harding was his father figure, so McMurphy showed up. So he gloms yeah. on to McMurphy uh, after, McMurphy after that uh, interaction on the, on the with the game. And so now we see the culmination of it here in this moment where he's screaming for Mac as if Mac can do anything because he's yeah. so desperate, you know. And then he's gone. We've got the chief. It's like a shark, man. It feels like a shark just killing them all one by one. They're just bobbing up oh, and down. God. And uh, McMurphy pulls out a stick of juicy fruit, hands it to the chief, and Chief Bromden says, Thank you. It's one of the great moments in a movie. A hundred percent, dude. A hundred percent. There are such great reveals in this film. The fact that they're all there voluntarily was a great reveal. And then a few minutes later, the chief being able to speak and understand everybody. It's just genius. I have such a strong memory of the first time I saw this at 12 or whatever years old in my parents' family room. And the moment he says, thank you, just going, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. And so in the book, uh, McMurphy and Chief Bromden are roommates. Mm. So they share a bedroom together and there are a bunch of clues that McMurphy is kind of starting to figure it out before this happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way this happens in the book is that they end up talking all night 
in the room. It doesn't happen waiting to get electroshock treatment. Wow. It happens them talking all night in the room. This is but, better for the movie, right? I think so. I think it's – well, but we're in a very dramatic spot, first of all. Right, right. Good point, yeah. And, and I love – I mean, Jack Nicholson plays it so perfectly with his reaction. And then I love that he takes out a second piece, hands it to him, and is watching him. You're like, yeah. did I really hear that? And he takes it <laughs> and he says – Sly son of a bitch, Chief. Can you hear me, too? Uh, so good. Christ. <laughs> you fooled him, Chief. You fooled him. You fooled them all. But this, again, this there's so much symbolism here because, you know, he's the only Native American character in the movie. And certainly in the 1970s with the AIM movement and other movements and Native Americans fighting back against the uh, against the establishment, uh, against the white power establishment in this country in the 1970s, and people overlooking Native Americans, right? Th- dismissing them and feeling like, you know, that, and Native Americans adopting to the being, playing the deaf and dumb type of situation in order to not get involved, in order not to get abused. And certainly now we see there's much more of a focus on uh, how uh, indigenous uh, women are treated in terms of the fact that their murders and their deaths are ignored by so many police departments across the country. Um, and so we see how this is a community that has constantly been overlooked or not factored into or felt that playing deaf or dumb to not be involved in all the shit uh, is just a better route so as not to get the abuse heaped on them. Because if they make themselves known, make their presence known, they incur the wrath and almost centuries-old wrath of a country that took land away from them and purposely put them on reservations to keep watch over them. So it's just that kind of thing you see here with Chief working through as maybe symbolic of that. You know, I'm not saying Foreman did it that way or Casey wrote it that way, but it certainly feels symbolic of that when you take the context of the 1970s and when this film was made. You are 100% right, and Casey really? did write it this way. <laughs> In fact, the story, so this is, I'll give you a little okay. bit of the backstory, as best yeah. I can remember from the book, is, so he grew up, uh, Bromden grew up, uh, his father was the chief and, mm-hmm. and kind of was in charge of this community and was a big, huge, powerful man, and the state wanted his land in order to build a, ban- a, a dam because they were going to mm-hmm. flood the land. I don't remember... And this is in the book. This is in the book. This is in the book. Um, And that one day when he's 10 or 11, some white folks come to go talk to his dad to get the rights to this land. Of course. And he's there and they're going, where can we find Chief Bromden, which is, you know, our chief's father. And he at 10 or 11 goes up to them and says, oh, my dad's over there. And this is the, and they, and they literally behave as if they can't even hear him because they're just talking to each other and they're just not interested in him. And this experience of people not seeing him or not hearing him, he grows into this big, huge guy who plays high school football and high school basketball and is kind of a star. And yet, even though he's this big, huge guy, he continues to have these experiences where it's like people can't see him or can't yeah. hear him. And so, him. The, and, and so the more and more he just started to behave the way he they expected him to behave, which right. was deaf and dumb. And this is the process of him shrinking, of him becoming a smaller and smaller person that nobody can see or hear and has no response to them. And that's how wow. he, and, and he served in the military, I think in World War II, or maybe it's in Korea, you know, and, and continually just ignored and ignored and ignored until he becomes this very small, in his mind, person wow. who can neither hear nor speak. Which makes sense when he says what he says to Murphy near the end of the movie, yeah. And this is when Murphy says, and it's funny that he's bonded with Chief, which, which is more clear in the book, but he's like, let's get out of here. Canada. We'll be there before these son of a bitches know what hit them. As they're talking about this, they wheel out Cheswick on a gurney, kind of yeah. mumbling and drooling. And then they call Dennis McMurphy's turn. And again, Jack Nicholson's, the way he plays this, which is still having the bravado yeah. and seeing the cracks and the real fear underneath the bravado. But he doesn't know. He knows he can't show any of that or believes right. he can't show any of that. Right. And he, like he gives the chief the thumbs up and the smile, and then we walk into this other room, and it is so scary. Yeah. 
And again, all of these people in this room are all doctors and nurses in the hospital. They've done electroshock. They are the ones who do it. And so they're just doing what they do. Wow. By the way, he has no idea this is going to happen, does he? Like he thinks like he's got one over on them or they're going to give him some kind of berating. And even while he's being strapped down, he seems to not want to understand or not really grasp what's happening. This is what's so tragic about this scene in Jack Nicholson's face. He seems to, Mark Murphy's face, he seems to not understand what's about to happen. It's funny. I interpret it totally differently, which is oh, I think okay. he totally knows what's going to happen. And he's trying to pretend like, like he doesn't care. Like he doesn't care. <laughs> Interesting. And, okay. and it's funny because he's he's making these jokes as they're kind of lowering him down and putting yeah. on the, you know, the conductive gel and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and you could see the 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 alternating between bluster and fear. Okay, this won't hurt and it'll be over in just a moment. Uh-huh. What's that? Conductant. A little dab will do you. And I'll tell you, having had multiple kind of surgery doctory things. Yeah. I get a lot funnier when <laughs> I'm in those situations. Going? Oh yeah, I become yeah. talkative. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, part of it is I'm a very curious person, so I'm asking questions about well, what is that, and why are you doing that, and where's that, you know. But I think part of it that's just my way of dealing with fear and not showing fear. You know. Yeah, I, I have that too. I, I'll be honest with you. Oh, I, you know, I normally try to make fun of stuff anyway, but like, yeah, certainly in those moments, like I remember the first colonoscopy, I was just like. You're going to use the whole tube, Doc? I said, <laughs> well, they put it in right to the, the Fletch thing. And even when sure. they were saying they were getting me under, I started singing Moon River as I passed out, you know? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm yep. stupid like that. So, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, particularly, you know, the, the, there's the classic masculine, you shouldn't be showing fear thing. Right. Oh, 100%. 100%. And then how, how do you channel all the things that you're feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open your mouth. What's that? This will keep you from biting your tongue. Uh, now just bite down on uh, it. Uh, That's right. Just bite down. Huh? Now bite down okay. on it. Watching this happen, and I think Jack does oh. a great job. Everyone does a great job. Oh, man. It's terrifying. <laughs> Dude, it really is. It really is. You know, because, like, just the, the, it's the, it's the aftershocks after the first shock that is <laughs> fucking yep. terrifying. You know, the initial shock is rough, but the, 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 the convulsing, you're just like, oh, fuck, man, is that what it's really like? Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I was a long time ago, and I can't remember the details, but I remember hearing a podcast or a lecture or something on the origins of um, electroshock therapy. Mm. And it really was just like some weird idea that some guy just, hey, let's try this. <laughs> you know, so much of so much of medicine is just trial and error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks. And they still do it. This still gets done sometimes. Yeah, we're back at a group session. I so remember watching this the first time because in comes McMurphy stumbling and drooling and everyone has this huge reaction to it. Yeah. And then he looks at the chief and gives him a wink and you're like, oh, he's playing. Yeah. He's playing. And then the big smile happens and he's the big gregarious outgoing person. <laughs> How about it, you creep, you lunatic, mental defective? Let's hear it for Bull Goose Randall back in action. Nice shirt, Chesaroo. <laughs> Why does he do this? Oh, just to fuck with him. Uh, it's also, like you just said, a masculine thing, right? Let me play at, oh, I'm a vegetable, I'm a vegetable, and then, ah, oh, I got you, motherfuckers. Like, it's his way of establishing his strength all over again, right? That he could mess with their emotions, but he's all right in the end. And so it was just in a way of reclaiming his alpha status in the group. Yeah. I think it's, it's totally, no, that didn't bother me at all. It's because right. it's also covering up because he had multiple shock treatments over the last week or something. And I think that's in more detail in the book. Um, and I think it was scary and horrible every, every fucking time mm -hmm. pretending that's not the case. Yeah. A hundred percent. You're right about that. They uh, was giving me 10,000 Watts a day, you know, and I'm hot to trot. Next woman takes me on is going to light up like a pinball machine and pay off in silver dollars. <laughs> you said making jokes, like you said, making jokes to yep. do with the reality, yeah. Well, that's an amusing thought, Randall, Thank but you. when you came in, we were talking to Jim. He has a problem with his medication, and we'd like to get back to that. Oh, I don't, I don't mind at all. I'm Nurse Ratchet, I'm uh, gentle as a puppy dog. Because and... I think his intention is he wants to, to at least appear like he is acquiescing to the group yeah 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 yeah. it's later at night nurse ratchet's leaving 
we cast catch our first glimpse of the night guy, and that is Scatman Crothers. Out of nowhere, Scatman Crothers in this movie, man. Is this so, before The Shining or after The Shining? It's before. Oh. Um, and, well, and what's funny is is Jack got Scatman both of these jobs because they're buddies. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. I think there was – I'd I have to go back and listen to our Shining episode <laughs> from years and years ago. But I think that Scatman was a replacement. I think someone else had that part first. And I, oh, in I, The Shining? In The Shining. I think oh, so. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, but I don't remember for sure. And I know that Kubrick put him, Scatman through hell, made him do like a hundred takes of one scene. Um, but apparently people were thrilled when Scatman showed up because Scatman showed up with his ukulele and he's singing songs and just a joyful, fun person to be around in this, you know, tar- dark, hard movie yeah. that he was great. And McMurphy gets on the phone and is obviously talking to one of the girls about getting there with some booze. And then he's later in the middle of the night, he starts waking people up. He wakes the chief up. Chief, I can't take it no more. I got to get out of here. I can't. I just can't. It's easier than you think, chief. For you, maybe. You're a lot bigger than me. Even though that's something that's throughout the whole book, I think just that one line does it for the movie you know what i mean and then he tells this story about his father my papa's real big he did like he pleased that's why everybody worked on him and this is the guy that was the chief when he was 10 was the leader of the community and he married a white woman who worked on him to use the chief's words oh wow he refused to sell the land and then the white world worked on him yeah. and eventually forced him to sell the land. And then we get to where he says, the last time I see my father, he was blinding the cedars from drinking. And every time he put the bottle to his mouth, he don't suck out of it. It sucks out of him until he shrunk so wrinkled and yellow. Even the dogs don't know him. I love the line. He didn't suck out of it. It sucks out of him. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's the, the whole book. That's right out of the book. The yeah. book is so beautifully poetic the way it's written. And then I love this moment too. He, McMurphy says, Killed him. Huh? I'm not saying they killed him. They just worked on him the way they worked on you. Mm. What does worked on him mean? Just the, I think to me, it's the verbal brow beating. It's the, um, instilling insecurity. It's the removal of power. It's the constantly making him feel lesser than so that he starts to diminish in size and in energy and in presence. And we see that, you know, and it's the same thing that we're experiencing as we're watching the movie, this idea that you cannot have somebody who is, um, you know, questioning the authority or going against the authority because they will slowly but surely use all their tactics and their power to bring you to heal. And that's what, in essence, I think he's saying that society broke him and that all these people worked on him um, emotionally and uh, mentally. By the way, the book, the chief's word for this is for society. He calls it, I think the combine. Mm. And he's always talking about the combine. The combine is doing this and the combine is doing that. Mm. Um, And here's the thing that I think about it is that I don't think there's always even a, they that are working on you. Mm -hmm. like there isn't a consciousness running a plan on you and you know what works on you is you get that credit card bill and you're just a little more behind than you thought you were going to be at the end of the month you know what i mean or you have to you 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 suddenly got sick and you had to take a couple of days off work and now you're a little bit more behind or you're just having to deal with just the life stuff and 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 that's what's working on you and it makes you feel small and it makes you feel like you don't have control that's the combine and i don't think there doesn't even need to be a nurse ratchet you know right right like you could have the boss at work who's not letting you do the thing you want to do or making things a little bit harder on you but yeah. he's not doing it to get you he's just mm-hmm. thinks he's doing his job and you know what he's getting worked on too yeah he's getting worked on from above yep yeah it always the shit always rolls downhill yeah everyone's getting yeah. worked on for sure and then there they are, they're here. And there we have not only uh, Candy from before, but we have Rosie too, yeah. two women. And now we have to negotiate with Scatman. And I love the negotiation. $20 to get down on your knees and pray, wouldn't you, Turkle? 
No, it don't send me. It don't send me. It don't. Huh? Don't do nothing to me now. Well, you know there'll be more. Maybe bringing a couple of bottles with them. And, uh... They gonna be sharing more than just bottles, ain't they? You know what I mean. Scatman's one of those great joys, I think, of that era. Yeah. yeah. But don't ignore the fact that he's essentially pimping out his friend to have sex with Scatman Crothers. And as we see in the film, this is not something these two women were bargaining for in this situation. So well, he is kind of, once again, McMurphy getting what he wants at the expense of other people's uh, situations, you know. Well, it, it also goes to this, you know, what I, you know we would call the Madonna whore mm, idea, which right, is right. that you have the totally controlling, domineering Nurse Ratchet on the one hand, and you have these completely willing, almost right. non-character women on the other hand, and that's all of women. And Billy's in, mom, yeah, it, it, as an energy, yeah, 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 yeah. She's on the Nurse Ratchet side, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then McMurphy starts blinking the lights. We hear medication time and he starts waking everybody up. And we see just the sort of flood of people coming towards the nurse's station where they'd normally get their medication. And now we're getting the booze is out. And Scatman is is starting to freak out about all this. Of course, it's his job on the line. Mike Murphy, what you trying to do? Get my ass really fired, man. Come on, get your this ass out of here. Come on, shit. Party my ass. This ain't no nightclub, man. This is stop. This is where, by the way, I to- the- McMurphy doesn't give a shit about. No, he doesn't. I know. No. So and he- there's no way this guy doesn't get fired. Oh, yeah. You know, which, yeah. I think he comes to terms with by the end of the this whole situation. <laughs> I think he's trying to get whatever he can get at a certain point. Well, yeah, what exactly. happens next is the night supervisor shows up and they're all hiding. And I like the Turkle is also hiding and McMurphy has to force him to go out and talk to her. Yeah. Who She sees one of the girls. Um, and at that point you kind of know that you're going to get fired. Yeah. Right. She opens but, the door with the girl. Yeah. But she goes away and then we have a party. Mm. How are you feeling watching this party happen? Dreadful, dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. When I was in my 20s, I was enjoying it, watching them all like unwind a little bit and have drinks. In my older age now, I'm watching it just completely worried about what this is going to do and what Nurse Ratchet is going to do to them once she gets into the ward and sees what happened. You know, I really have a perfect mix of dread and fun. Yeah. <laughs> like part of me is laughing because it is funny and they're really yeah, having fun. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, I mean, the, you know, like pouring booze through like enema tubes and, you know, like yeah. giving the booze to the guy who's obviously had a lobotomy. And like, I mean, it's all bizarre and crazy, but it's they're having fun. And Billy is dancing with candy and smiling and yeah. Cheswick is watching and Billy's dancing even closer. And uh, and then he gets the uh, Murphy gets the keys from Scatman, who's passed out. Yeah. And. He's starting to say his goodbyes because he's unlocked the door and it's time to go. You say goodbye to me, Mac? Sure, I'm going to say goodbye to you, Charles. Hey, Mac. Mac? Yeah. Thank you, Mac. And then Billy's obviously upset. I'm, I'm going gonna, to gonna miss you very, 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 very much, Mac. And he wants him to go with him. And Billy doesn't think he can go and he's going to give him his address in Canada and all this stuff. Right. But there's something else going on with Billy because he says, is she, 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 she going with you? And we realize that Billy is thinking about Candy mm-hmm. and kind of goes, are you going to marry her? You know, is this, is she your girl? And man, both Brad DeReef and Jack are so good in the mm-hmm. scene. You want to date with her? No. <laughs> Jesus, I must be crazy to be in a lonely event like this. Date, huh? Well, it'll have to be a fast date, I'll tell you that. And Billy suddenly realizes he's talking about what Jack is really saying, or what Randall P. McMurphy is really saying, is, do you want to have sex with Candy right now, quickly, yeah. before we leave? Yeah. And now Billy starts to panic. And stutters, a lot of stutters. Not, not now. You busy right now, are you? You got something to do. Right now, you got something to do? Uh, no, 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 no. Good. No. Well, then don't talk to me about when no, you're no, ready. No, yeah, no. yeah. Mac, oh, Mac. yeah. Ready and no, everything no, like that. No. Candy, come here a minute. And they grab him, break, grab Candy, 
and they open up one of the rooms and they put Billy in a wheelchair and yes, they force him into the room with candy and close the door. Yeah. And then all, all the guys go up and push him around the door because they want to listen. He uh, hands Scanlon those dirty playing cards he has. Yeah. And he takes a big, huge swig of booze and he sits down in this chair and he smiles and the camera stays on him and stays on him. And I kept writing as I was watching this shot. It's like kind of amazing shot I wrote. Yeah. And then, and then I wrote, is this Jack Nicholson's best performance? <laughs> and then he has this thought you see thoughts go through his head i don't want to move past this moment i want us to go back to this moment because it struck me watching the film this time around you're watching an actor organically process multiple emotions as he's staring out there and giving you enough of a um open reaction that you can interpret it a million different ways and as he's sitting there and he's a little drunk or he's a lot drunk He's just staring out there and his face is so serious. And you're wondering to yourself, is this an after result of the shocks? Is this him like the end of graduate at the end of the graduate? Oh, great. We, we got married uh, and we're building against our parents. Oh shit. Now what? And is this him sitting there being like, Oh, now what? Now that I've done all this, where do I go next? What do I do next? Uh, Or Will I be able to do what I say I'm going to do, which is to leave? So there's so much here in my mind that I'm interpreting. And of course, maybe you saw something else. Other people are going to see something else. But there's a lot going on in his mind there. Um, and we, we may even glimpse a little bit of his evil streak in there, too, with the way his face is so emotionless in certain sections of, sections of that scene. So I found it to be fascinating and very much connected it to the end of The Graduate. And it's just absolutely captivating. He has a sort of an odd smile and then another thought and he seems content maybe. And then he's sleepy and his eyes close. Yeah. It is. I don't know what the fuck is going on. And it is amazing. And actually we got a question about this moment. So. Oh, good. Um, in fact, we have two questions about this moment. The first Ooh. is from Anthony Pomus, uh, who is asking, is Randall McMurphy actually crazy before he gets to the psych ward or is he pushed into craziness after the shock treatment and then he writes there's this peculiar but beautiful moment late in the film after mcmurphy has been able to get his two girlfriends in through the ward's window yeah at the party he can leave if he wants but instead he sits in a chair and this strange darkness comes over him followed after a long pause by a sort of self-knowing smile so does he know that to be in this life anywhere is to be insane does he give up his right his life right there and then to ratchet to the hospital, to this whole sodden world? That's a great question. Yep. Because he does fall asleep. Yep. Yeah, I don't, that's a great point. Because that's the thing that I was just saying is like, I feel like he's not sure he can go through with it. And if, even if he does, what is there out there for him? At least here, he has power. At least here, he has a worthy foe, and there's parameters for, from which he can rebel from. And there are rules he can rebel at, and there are things that he can do to push the boundaries and still feel somewhat safe. See, I don't think he's the ultimate rebel. I think he's a safe rebel in that he rebels within the confines of, some, of a, a system that takes care of him at the same time. And so he's not quite willing to risk it all. And in that moment, the fact that he falls asleep makes me 100% question the dedication he had to be this rebel uh, in this ward. Because in that moment, he doesn't go through with it. You know who goes through with it? The chief, a few minutes later. He legitimately breaks out. He legitimately takes advantage, whereas Jack blows it at the moment of, or McMurphy rather, blows it at the moment of truth. By falling asleep because he doesn't really want to do it. Well, it's so hard for me to go. It's my opinion. It's such an unknowable moment. It's, we have a similar question from Paul Sevilla. Okay. Who writes, this is a great film. He said, one thing that's always haunted me about this film is near the end, R.P. Murphy had a chance to escape the institution, but decided to spend more time and party with his fellow inmates. Yeah. That decision doomed him in the end. Mm-hmm. Why did Murphy decide to stay rather than escape immediately? Here's, so here's my thinking 
at this moment. Okay. <laughs> you know, the next time I watch the film, I might think something differently. <laughs> I think, I think that McMurphy is basically a narcissist who cares most about himself and his own yes. pleasure. Yes. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't care about these other guys. I think he does genuinely care. I think he is happy that Billy is getting laid at this moment. Sure. I think he saw the romantic nature of Billy who talked about proposing to this girl that again got shut down by his mom. He talks about, he had this moment where he saw Billy laughing and talking to Candy on the boat and then dancing with her. And I think, I think he has come to care about these people. And I also think that is, yes, it is. Is it about power for McMurphy? Yeah. But I don't think he's ever had these kinds of experiences in the army, on the work farm, in prison, <sighs> I think different things happened with these very strange people and there's something special about that to him. That's what I think. You're a much more positive person and I respect that because that's actually a really good way to look at it too in that he doesn't want to leave because for the first time ever he's actually found a community. Yeah. And that he can be a part of. And although he may rebel against the person who's in charge of the community from time to time, there's still a comfort level in this community feeling of acceptance and he feels... He's getting the, as you said, the narcissist, he's getting that satisfied by the fact that people look right. up to him, call for him, respect him. And so that matters to him. And maybe in the end, that long look or the long uh, camera staying on his face, that long scene there is him realizing that at the end, which is what helps him to fall asleep. It's a sense of comfort. And so he can go back to, so he can go to sleep, you know, and understand the situation in that drunken state that he's in, the kind of logic that creeps in is this idea that maybe it's not so bad here, you know? Well, but the one other thing is, uh, I think, you know, Paul asks, why did he decide to stay? For me, I don't think he decided to stay. Mm. I think he fell asleep. I really? Think there's a tragic, oh yeah, I don't, I think <sighs> he was like, all right, just, you know, as soon as Billy's done, I gotta get the hell out of here. I still have plenty of time to make it. And he falls asleep. I have, to disagree, with, I have to disagree with my colleague. I have to say that I think... <laughs> I think he he got to a place where he either accepted the situation or and doesn't and neither and didn't want to admit it to himself or he he did admit it to himself. Either way, you don't fall asleep when you're scared. You fall asleep and you don't fall asleep when you want to do something. You fall asleep when you feel comfortable. Or yeah, and that's usually because it wasn't like he was up for three nights in a row or something like shit. Like he was just there waiting for Billy to have sex. It literally was going to be 10 minutes probably. And he could have, but he felt this sense of comfort and the sense of comfort let him put his guard down and putting his guard down is what let him fall asleep. That's what I think. It's perfectly possible. The one yeah, thing I, I do know either way, which is great yeah. is the dread <laughs> is so fucking high. <laughs> it's a, and what's crazy about it is yeah. the dread is so fucking high. And yet watching it the first time, I could not have imagined how actually terrible what's about to happen is yes yeah. you know what i mean yeah, yeah because then it's morning and we just see the complete wreck <laughs> they made at this hospital yeah. and in comes the orderlies and in comes nurse ratchet and mcmurphy wakes up and sees her close the window and lock the screen right they find rosie and get rid of her and then they are trying to just gather everyone up and see if anyone's missing and of course when mcmurphy wakes up that window is open yeah. You know, yeah. it's like right next to him. And finally they go, looks like Billy is the only one missing. Did Billy Bibbit leave the grounds of the hospital, gentlemen? And people start to giggle because they all know where <laughs> Billy is. I want an answer to my question. Did he leave the grounds of the hospital? Um, and they start searching for Billy. And then we hear... It's Ratchet. Because the young nurse has the door open and they all go to look. And there is Billy in bed with Candy. Yeah. Um, and he comes out sort of stumbling and pulling his pants up and they applaud as he kind of falls and they, there's laughter and he says, um, I can explain everything. He doesn't stutter. Right. That's the fucking thing, man. Aren't you ashamed? No, I'm not. No stutter. Hmm. What do you think about that? I think he's, he's obviously, you know, having sex can change a person for the first time. There's a strength in that. Also seeing the guys laugh for him as if they're cheering for him. That's probably the first time he's ever felt people behind him. And so there's a strength that comes 
in those two fleeting moments that you can glimpse the possibility of a of a Billy Bibbit that could have a that could function in this world possibly. I think the reaction I had when I first saw this movie is kind of what sticks with me because when I was 12 or whatever, mm. and I saw this moment, I went, it's like he's cured. Is that he's been on some level dominated by women his whole life and romantically drawn to women his whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that he finally got to have sex and have a truly loving, tender, gentle moment where a woman showed physical love and care for him, yeah. he's okay. And that if he pursued this, he could, it's just what you said, he could be okay. Yeah. It's not, and as an older person now, I go like, look, you don't get magically cured from difficult things right. in just one moment. That's not how life works. Yeah. Right. But I still go. Paid in essence to be with him. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely true. But I still go, he could be okay. And then the mom stuff. You know, Billy, what worries me is how your mother is going to take this. I wrote down and I bolded it. Every once in a while I bold things in my notes to make sure that I don't miss them. Yeah. I wrote down, might be one of the cruelest things I've ever seen in film. Yeah. That's this is where I think she becomes overtly cruel. Agreed. It is... I think she is upset. I think she's upset at McMurphy. She's upset at mm -hmm. what happened to her well-controlled hospital. And she sees, you know, it's so funny. I don't know why this just popped into my brain, but the in breakfast club with Bender and the teacher is that yeah. he sees one. It's like Randall McMurphy is the Bender of this yeah. group. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what she is doing is she goes, not, I'm going to take down Randall McMurphy. Right. She says, I'm going to take down the weakest member and destroy them mm -hmm. in order to maintain control on some level. And as soon as she says, your mother, the stutter is back. Yeah. Um, um, well, you, you, you don't, don't have to t t t tell her, Miss Ratchet. I don't have to tell her. Your mother and I are old friends. You know that. And you cut to McMurphy and the rage on his face and watching this. Yeah. He can, Billy can now barely talk. Um, please no, 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 don't t t tell my mother. Don't you think you should have thought of that before you took that woman in that room? And now he's trying to get out of it, Billy is. No, no. I... I died, I died, I died, I died, I didn't. You mean she dragged you in there by force? What's so weird about it is that what Nurse Ratchet has created is two scenarios. One, he dragged her in by force. Yeah. Two, she dragged him in by force. There's no scenario that she's putting forward that it could be okay that they just had sex. Right. What's so amazing watching this scene is every one of those patients, even Martini, even Cheswick, everyone knows what Nurse Ratchet is doing is wrong. Yeah. Right, because maybe they've had their moments, yeah, and she's used the knowledge and used the button against yeah. them. Everyone's got that button. Well, when someone knows that button, it's rough. Well, and because she know Billy can't take responsibility for this himself at this mm -hmm. moment, or is trying to get out of it. Every everybody did. Everybody, who did? You tell me who did. She forces him to turn on everybody else, including turn on McMurphy, and blame them. McMurphy. Which is a terrible thing to do to someone. Yep. Miss Ra Ratchet. Please, please don't tell Mr. Warren. My mother, please. And he gets down on his knees and is begging and screaming and saying no. And then, man, he starts to punch himself. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I. Yeah. I've been there. Um, where you punch yourself and anger at yourself and in shame or embarrassment or just utter inability to process what's happening to you emotionally in that moment. It, 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 it's been an impulse of mine for a very long time until maybe eight, 10 years ago, well, maybe even less, um, where I stopped doing that. But it's certainly a, just a feeling of like, you can't control what's happening and you have so many emotions running through you, rage, fear, shame, um, 
embarrassment, all of it, and you can't process it because you don't have the emotional vocabulary to process it. So almost in a way to kind of control it, you unleash, you hurt yourself. And I don't mean like other people, some people do it cutting and what have you, but like, I know for me, I would punch myself in the head sometimes in, in reaction to a frustration um, in certain moments, you know? So I understand what he's doing. It's just, it's hard to watch someone else do it when you're doing it. It doesn't feel like it's the wrong thing, but when you watch someone else doing it, it's really chill. Sure. You know? Well, I mean, she's weaponized guilt and shame yeah, yeah. against him. A hundred percent. And she's, so all of the faults are internally in Billy. Mm-hmm. And so his only way to combat the terrible things inside him, which by the way, aren't fucking terrible. Right. right. And he's just a normal horny kid, you know, who has, yeah. it's, it, the only way to combat it is to hit himself because yeah. that's the villain. He's the villain of the whole story. Right. And he just fucking per- betrayed McMurphy who, right. who he idolizes as a father figure. So the mother figure of nurse ratchet by summoning his actual mother forces him to betray his father figure, yep. you know? And now he's, it just, and they drag him away screaming and hitting himself. And I just, you know, I, I, I went like, we talk about the great villains mm-hmm. of film history. Yeah. And it's like, there's people like Darth Vader or Heath Ledger's Joker, or Anton Chigur, Hans and Die Hard, Hannibal Lecter. Compare what they do to what Nurse Ratchet does in this moment. Hmm. They're so, I mean, they kill a whole bunch more people. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, but. but the cruelty of this moment is so awful for me. But that's the truth of our society. We let people, we punish people more for the actual physical death of somebody. And I think we really drop the ball in how we punish people who turn people into the living dead. And I mean, people who sexually assault, sexually abuse, child sexual abuse, they, that kind of stuff can kill a person from the inside out. And I think we're way too lenient on that. And we don't understand, you know, like people who, trick people into lo- in losing all of their money. There's a destruction sure. of the soul that comes with that for the people who lose their money. These people go off and go to jail for like six years and come out of it and still have most of that money to use. Whereas the person who lost all their savings in some kind of Ponzi scheme or some scheme that they got taken advantage of um, has no restitution for the most part and is left with the feelings of guilt and shame and embarrassed, especially older yeah. people, because it does happen to a lot of elderly, which is why they try to stop that kind of stuff. And for me, I think people who do that should get the death penalty. I think people who do that should go to jail for the rest of their lives in the most hardcore prison ever. I don't think you're going to stop you from doing that until you enact measures that are comparable to murder and punishments that are comparable to murder punishments is what I'm trying to say, because people don't understand. And so what she, I agree, I agree with you. What she does here is in essence kill him from the inside out. Yeah. And so what happens next is the next logical thing that would happen in his mind because he's already dead in his mind. Oh, I mean I I not even to comment on the you know people ripping other people off. Mm. The, 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 the I think everybody walks around with some words in their head that someone particularly a oh, parent yeah said sure. to them sure. that you just never get past right. on some level. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those people frequently don't even know the thing that they said was hurtful, you know? Right, right, right. right. They're not even aware of it, but we walk around with these scars forever. Oh, yeah. Of those, no, of you're those right. words. You're you know? absolutely right, yeah. McMurphy still has the keys, and he's trying to open up the window, and an orderly comes over, and what does McMurphy do? He punches the orderly. Matt Murphy, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Now, is anything he's doing right now make any damn sense at all? No, I think he's just, he's like caged animal trying to run. Yeah. Yeah. He, he just has to get the fuck out of there and he's going to do yeah. it any way he can. I like that Washington puts like a leather strap around his knuckles and says, Put down those keys and nobody gets hurt. And Murphy puts down the keys, but I don't think he puts them down in a way like he's going to surrender. No, no, no. Puts them on the windowsill. And the chief is right there with him. Yeah. And then, right, and we think we're going to have a fight. I, I don't think I had any any thought of what was about to happen was about to happen when I first saw this movie. 
And the young nurse comes running in covered in blood and practically collapses onto Nurse Ratchet. She falls on Ratchet, yeah, from, out of shock. Yeah. You know, yeah. And outside that window is Rosie is the, or the girls. And they're yeah. saying, come on, Mac, let's go. Yeah. And he could go through right then, Nurse Ratchet and the crowd go to where the scream came from. Let me through! And as she pushes her way through the crowd, we get our first glimpse of Billy dead on the ground because he has slit his own throat. And then McMurphy looks in and sees what's happened. It is so shocking. Like my, my stomach is twisted just describing what's happening here. Yeah, yeah. And then Nurse Ratchet says, in that same Nurse Ratchet tone. Now calm down. The best thing we can do is go on with our daily routine. And this is where I see what Milos Forman is talking about. Right, this idea of what he grew up with, which is we've ta- this person has killed himself, or there's something really traumatic that has happened to this member of your society. The best thing you do is forget about it and keep moving on with your life. The best thing is it's just, that's what this power structure wants you to do. And what is McMurphy's reaction to her saying, "Let's go back to our routine"? Is he attacks her? All right, oh, 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 Max, yeah. don't chokes her pushes her up against the wall when he does this it makes me think of um what we talked about with uh, tarantino and inglorious bastards oh yeah his need to have his hands choking diane kruger which i think is the stupidest thing in the world here we have jack nicholson doing this with louise fletcher and we don't need to see his hands on her neck we see her reaction as any actress worth their salt can play this situation and is believable as hell and it's scary Jack is scary. And I also think about Godfather Part Two when Pacino actually slaps yeah. Diane Keaton. And I wonder how much of Jack was actually choking her, especially when you've seen him like prep for the scenes with Shelley Duvall in The Shining. And it's really scary what he's doing to prep for those scenes. Um, and Shelley does not look happy about it. So you just kind of look at this and you wonder how much of Jack was actually choking her versus how much was staged. But either way, it's horrific to see him banging her head against the door and then banging her head on the floor. Like it's just scary as hell. It's funny. I thought about exactly those same moments Mm. uh, that you brought up and what I don't have, I couldn't find anything of Louise Fletcher talking about this moment. It definitely looks rough. It doesn't, this, this does not look stagey. This looks like it hurt. Interesting. And there's some stories where actors will say, because I saw one quote from Diane Keaton saying, because he really hits her, yeah, is saying that it was great, and that they, she asked him to do it and it was great. Mm. And I've seen other quotes, or I think you mentioned another one where that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? I mean, and Hoffman hit Meryl Streep, right? And Kramer versus Kramer in right. that scene. And so, yeah, it's just crazy what, I don't know, just crazy to me what you know people thought was okay. Anyway. I mean, it's, I I don't have, I know that I would not teach my students to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also know that some of my favorite movies of all time have some of this shit in it. Right. You know what I mean? So I, I that's kind of where I, I, but needless to say, he is brutally choking her. Uh, would uh, McMurphy have killed her in this moment? Oh, absolutely. Unchecked? Yes. Yeah. Me too, 100%. Yeah. They drag him off. Uh, we've kind of talked about this a bunch, but I'm going to read the question anyway. Another question from Anthony Pomes says, is nurse Mildred Ratched really trying to do what's best for the men in the psych ward, or is she engaged perhaps in a form of warfare that results in the suicide of Billy, and is Billy's death actually a sacrifice upon the societal guilt altar over which nurse Ratched presides as a sadistic priestess? This, again, what is the sadism here that she's doing? I really need to have this some of you who are listening, I want to hear where you think she's sadistic. Are there moments where she like uses something against certainly the moment of Billy? That's a terrible decision by her. But how many of you have said the wrong thing about a person's past in an interaction with a friend or a family member and they flipped out and you used it on purpose? You know, that's a mistake. But sadism is a whole nother thing. And I don't think she's sadistic. I think she thinks there's a certain way to run this society that because of what she's studied and knows about these people in their files, she thinks she's doing the right thing. Whether she's right or not is a whole separate conversation. But she thinks she's doing the right thing. 
I don't think she's being sadistic, even after Billy kills himself. And she reacts to that. She's horrified by it. Oh, she yeah. ushers everybody out and she tells them all to go on with their society. Now, you can look at it and go, as I said, it's a, 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 you know, a society trying to control its populace and whatever. The other side of it is these are unstable people and you want to get them back into their routine as soon as possible or else they're going to flip out and go off the rails or things are going to – chaos is going to ensue, Right. When you're dealing with children, that is a big deal, is, is what I've read, because I've never had a child, but what I've read is routine is very important for children to establish a sense of um, parameters in their lives. And so I think what she's doing in that moment is trying to get them to not think about it because she doesn't want all these people flipping out at the same time. But it can also be seen, obviously, as Miloš intended, which is a society trying to control its people and ignore the horrors they are doing. So. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> um, this movie really affected me man and this is why i was afraid of talking about this film with for doing for the show even though i'm enjoying it is why i was afraid to talk about it. um i think i agree with you i don't think she's sadistic sadistic implies that she's getting pleasure out of other yes. people's pain we don't see that in any moment that she's getting pleasure out of her I, I, and i have a weird i i, I you know it's funny We've kind of been answering this question or struggling with this question the mm. whole time, mm. but I'm glad that we had Anthony Pomas ask it again yeah, thank because you. I want to frame it in a different way. If you say that Nurse Ratchet is a horrible, sadistic villain who likes to destroy these men, then this movie is just about her. She's unique. Right. If you say, because every hospital they went to that, that when they were location scouting, people said, there's our Nurse Ratchet. Yep. If we say that Nurse Ratchet is symbolic of institutions that break people down and use guilt and shame and all of these societal levers to control people and make us more uniform and less different and re reduce our freedom, that's a scarier story, I think. So, yeah, I, I think she's scarier when she's symbolic of yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff. And I don't think – although she sees Murphy as – threatening his her authority it's not an equal match she doesn't see him as a rival she sees him as a nuisance that she has to deal with people too, i think people too often when they analyze this film see them as equals they're not equals in her mind in nurse ratchet's mind he is just a nuisance another nuisance he is not special he is not somehow equal to her in power he isn't in her mind right she has the entire hospital behind her. He yeah. has a bunch of unstable people in a ward. It's not the same thing. And so I think sometimes people default to thinking that somehow Jack was going to overcome her or McMurphy was going to over overcome her in some way. And that was never going to happen. Never. I think one of the mistakes that we make is you find a tool that works and you think that tool works for everything. Mm -hmm. Is right. that Nurse Ratchet? is part of this institution and this is how this institution works yeah and it seems like part of the strategy is we have to break these men down yeah before yeah, yeah. we can build them back up right and it's funny because my son goes to a very progressive school and it is very much the philosophy is kids need love and support in order to thrive mm -hmm. and so if there's something wrong that means they're not getting one of their needs met and we have to find what that need is and we have to meet that need and oh, there's a lot of love and affection and positive reinforcement all that stuff and those are good tools i know from my son they are not always the most useful tools and my son needs more discipline and structure and negative consequences and things like that in addition to the positive reinforcement yeah and it's like man, if they had let him, it's like that boat trip was really good for him. That basketball game was good for them. I think that her toolbox isn't really always working is the problem. Yeah. No, that's it's fair. Not, it's not that everything in her toolbox is wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, that's all she's got. Yep. hundred percent. So it's some amount of time later, we see nurse ratchet in a big neck brace and everyone's speculating about McMurphy. And some people even think that he beat up some attendants and escaped. Yeah. There's rumors going around and then it's the middle of the night and chief is in bed and he hears something. And then we see a figure and there are two guys helping McMurphy into the room. And he looks a lot like he looked when he was playing that joke. Yeah. And so maybe he's just having fun and they lie him down on the bed. I knew you wouldn't leave without me. I was waiting for you. Now we can make it, Mac. I 
feel big as a damn mountain. So he's become himself again. Yeah, yeah, he's found his strength again. Yeah. Somehow this process, and if McMurphy had not come along, he I don't think he ever would have. I, yeah, probably not. And then he sees something and he turns McMurphy's head and we see those two scars because he's been lobotomized. Yep. And there's just this dead, empty, blank, stupid look on McMurphy's face. Yeah. And he lifts him up and he shakes him a little bit and he hugs him and says, I'm not gone without you, man. I wouldn't leave you here this way. You're coming with me. And he lowers him down on the bed. And then the chief takes a long look at him and we hear that music rising. Ah, great Native American music, music right? Uh, ex- yeah. a cue here. It's just so good. And again, the, the composer is Jack Nietzsche. And I, what I think I didn't re- mention is that I said that Michael Douglas got him because a friend recommended him, but I don't think I mentioned that the friend was Art Garfunkel. Mr. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he says, Bo Goldman, the screenwriter, thinks that let's go before the chief kills Randall P. McMurphy is the best line he's ever written. Wow. And I get it. Yeah. Because what do you say in the moment before you kill the man? Mm-hmm. He goes, let's go. Yeah. Because I think McMurphy, the spirit of McMurphy is going with him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not staying in this place. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I remember watching as a kid, like the realization, like, oh my God, the chief is about to kill McMurphy. Yeah. Who, but, and by the way, as a kid, I had none of the feelings that we've discussed about how he's an agent of chaos and maybe not such a good guy. Right, right. When I was a kid, I thought McMurphy was awesome. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And he pulls the pillow off and we see the just, dead face and chief problem strides into the tub room he goes to the hydrotherapy console he reaches down it's it and i wrote i literally as i'm writing this down i wrote it's so amazing and then i wrote it's so fucking powerful and the music is building and the water shoots out like a baptism yep and he lifts this thing up And it's just so, it's heroic in this totally bizarre way as he strides through the room and everyone else is waking up and seeing what's happening. Of course, they were there in the room when McMurphy failed to lift this thing up. And the chief picks this thing up over his head and he smashes it through the window. And Tabor starts laughing and screams and Martini wakes up. And he climbs out. And that last look, by the way, from Christopher Lloyd is uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. And then we see the chief go off into the distance, into the mountains, and he disappears. And that is the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I don't know. It's one of those endings that's so powerful, and I don't know what I'm feeling. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, what is this? I, I, you know, the, my, the, the main character of the movie was lobotomized and then his friend killed him and his friends escaped. And I don't know. It's, it's such a profound movie. Well, like um, you were saying earlier, when you rebel in a society like this, it's just, it's almost like machine gun rebelling. You're just going to do anything. And so there's no logic. There's no norm. And in this situation, the fact that they took away his individuality by lobotomizing him, means he is no longer who he is anymore. And a free spirit like that would not want to stay alive just to be in essence, you know, not who they are, brain dead in essence. Um, And yes, I know lobotomy is not brain death, but in essence, you've killed his spirit. You killed his essence. So him killing him is an act of mercy. Yes. In a situation like this. And then him picking up that thing is a way of honoring McMurphy. Because of McMurphy saying, what did he say to the guys when he walked out? At least I tried. Yep. And this is Chief trying by ripping this thing out. And you could argue his rep- ripping out a very strong part of that patriarchal, or I'm sorry, not patriarchal, but this society and throwing it through the window, smashing the window, creating a way to escape. And everybody reacting to it shows that there's such power in this moment. Um, because he said he wasn't gonna let him down and he didn't by breaking out of there. And he, and his spirit goes with him. McMurphy's spirit goes with him wherever he goes as a, like a lesson or as a way to maybe understand people when they're like this or whatever, you know, be more understanding. So there's so much that comes with this ending that I think is 
fantastic and as you said powerful for sure their first cut was well over three hours <laughs> their second cut was two hours and 25 minutes which they felt was just still way too long and then they did and this i do this too is that you're, i mean your first cut's always really long and then you're cutting it down and cutting it down and then you do what i always call the crazy cut which is you cut it down as far as you possibly can so they cut down another 30 minutes out of or 40 minutes out of it mm. got it down to like 145 and went okay they watched it and the 145 version felt way longer than the two hours and 25 minute version and it's because they didn't give you enough time to really get to know the characters yeah and so the movie felt slow so then they put 15 minutes back in and then that's when it really starts to work yeah and and they had their first screening up in berkeley and that's when they knew they were onto something quick story that I thought was really interesting was there was a kid who was a patient at the hospital and who I picture looking like Billy and that they had him be Saul Zant's assistant and he's helping out on the movie. And about halfway through the shoot, he comes up to Saul Zant and Michael uh, Douglas and says, I just found out that you treat everybody the same. It's like if, if someone does something wrong, you tell them, you tell them they did something wrong. And if you do the same thing, if they did something right, and it doesn't matter who you are. Like you treat everybody else exactly that way. And Saul and Michael burst into tears at being told that huh. because, and I get, I totally get it. Yeah. And he, and they, and then this kid said that he just never experienced being treated that way. And they go, look, we're going to come back to this hospital when we finish the movie and we'll, we'll screen it and you can watch it then and see what your good work did. And they came back and that kid was gone because right after the movie left, he checked himself out because he felt better. Oh, wow. Like the move working on the movie really helped him. That's incredible. It was released on November 19th, 1975. It was the second highest grossing film of 1975, the seventh highest grossing movie of all time. And you know what? You do pretty good. You do pretty well doing number two in 1975 because number one <laughs> was a little movie called Jaws. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you remember how I said that uh, Jack Nicholson took a cut in pay and a bigger cut of the movie? Yeah. yeah. His percentage of this film was $16 million. Wow. That's how much he made. He did the same thing with Batman. And he, yep. Been, yep. Kirk Batman. Douglas made more money on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest than he worked on any other movie he had ever acted in. Wow. Yeah. It was nominated for Picture, Director, Actor, Actress, Supporting Actor for Brad Dreef, Adapted Screenplay, Cinematographer, Editor, and Score. Jack Nicholson was up against Walter Matthau for The Sunshine Boys, Al Pacino for Dog Day Afternoon, Maximilian Schell for The Man in the Glass Booth, a movie I've never seen, and James Whitnor for Give Him Hell, Harry, which I've also never seen. Uh, but Jack Nicholson won. Uh, Brad Dreef lost Supporting Actor to George Burns for The Sunshine Boys. Yep. Uh, Louise Fletcher won Best Actress, beating uh, Isabella Johnny, but for the story of Adele H. and Margaret for Tommy. I can't believe she's nominated. That's a very strange movie. <laughs> Glenda Jackson for Hedda Gabler and Carol Kane for Hester Street. I did not know Carol Kane had uh, had an Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. um, cinematography went to Barry Lyndon. Uh, it won for directing against Stanley Kubrick for Barry Lyndon, Sidney Lumet for Dog Day Afternoon, and, and uh, Robert Altman for Nashville. Editing and music, of course, went to Jaws. Um, and this is one of only three films to sweep the big categories of director, picture, actor, actress. The other two being It Happened One Night and Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Um, we have one more question that I'm going to read but can't really answer. <laughs> this is from uh, Kimberly Rogers, who I've known for a long time. Uh, she says, for Steve, the research machine, what was the power or not on closing the big psych warehouses in the 80s and 90s, did any politician cite the movie or the mood of the movie where these psych hospitals rightly or unfairly demonized by the 70s movies? And has that led to more people on the streets that may have actually benefited from being housed in treatment facilities? Kimberly, I tried to do some research on this and I couldn't find an answer, but I do definitely think this movie shaped the way we saw uh, institutions like this. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. I think the same thing happened with prisons during the 70s and some of those films, Rue Baker and other ones that mm. kind of exposed the corruption that was going on in these prisons and the documentaries that came out of that as well. So, yeah. All right. So, John, we've gotten there. We've reached this moment where now we have to sum up 
yeah. our feelings about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. What do you think? I got to say, man, uh, you know, as I've said a number of times in the first, in these two parts, I was really hesitant in our, in our own personal conversations off mic. I was really hesitant about walking back into this movie for fear of the emotional damage it was going to leave within me for fear that because of the mental health struggles I've been through, how it was going to devastate me or affect me, or maybe send me, send me tumbling back down for a day into those dark places. And it actually did quite the opposite. It re-inspired my love of movies. It re-inspired my love of films from the 1970s and really got me to enjoy Jack Nicholson again as an actor, respect Louise Fletcher and the work she did in this character, and reappraise these characters in a way that I didn't when I was younger. And I know I've said this ad nauseum on this show multiple times, but the great films are the ones you can revisit every decade that you get older and find something completely different to get out of them. And I think that speaks volumes about this film. Milos Forman doing a wonderful job directing this thing, a great cast coming together, feeling the actual visceral vibe of this ward uh, through every performance here and finding yet again, a new appreciation for the character of chief and what he brought to this um, uh, ensemble and what he brought to this film as well. But overall, just kind of a different approach to um, looking at heroes and villains and the gray areas that they exist in, especially in the in the best films of the 1970s, like this one is. I am struggling, John. Huh? I'm really okay. struggling on how to sum up a movie that's very difficult to sum up. And I think we've we've said this from the beginning of the Cinephiles that movies are different at different times that you come to them in your life. I don't think there's any movie that I felt more strongly that way than this movie. Hmm. I was wrecked, absolutely destroyed the first time I saw it. Yeah. When I watched it four or five years ago, I was struck by how much fun it is when it's fun. Yes. yes. Yeah. And and then watching it this time, and, and a lot of this came out of the conversations with you, is I was really struck by, you know, I had a, I thought McMurphy was a hero as a kid. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm really struck by the ambiguity of McMurphy. And while I don't go, Nurse Ratchet is awesome. I want to hang out with her. She's like, hero, I'm not feeling that. Right. But I am definitely feeling that there is a lot more going on. And I also think this was a movie that was created in a time where we had stronger feelings about traditional masculinity. And it was coming right after the 60s. And this is so a part of the 60s where it's about rebelling against the establishment. And now we're in this place where politically and in all sorts of other ways, those things have flipped around in yeah. lots of ways. Yeah. And so where we fit in all this stuff, I'm struggling to come up with. And here's here's kind of where I'm landing, which is I really, really do believe in the individual's freedom and that that freedom can be weird, mm -hmm. you know, and challenging and difficult. And it's not, you know, we're not supposed to be just spoon fed everything that's nice and clean and simple, right. but that things can be uncomfortable and that's still okay yeah and on the other hand i can simultaneously and this came out of the conversation with you yeah. be real worried about what happens when the lunatics take control of the institution yeah you know because we've seen the lunatics take control of certain institutions yes and i can point to i'm not pointing at one side of the political divide i think there's some lunatics on both sides and i can worry about that too and and in the end though I can still be completely devastated, moved, made to laugh, made to think by this incredible, incredible film with incredible performances, yeah. top to bottom. Yeah. So that's what we think of One Threw Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I'd love to hear what all of you think. Just visit us on our Facebook page, do a search for The Cinephiles. You can also follow us on Cine underscore files, The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. You can... Uh, Subscribe. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, all of those places. Your reviews on Apple Podcasts still matter. We still love reading your comments on YouTube, and we'd still love you to buy or stream One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest through cinephiles.net, along with every other movie we ever reviewed. And if you want to join us on Patreon, you're seeing how many new things we're doing. We're doing monthly watch-alongs, more Q&As. We're trying to bring more of your direct questions into our longer episodes like we have in this. And, of course, we always have our Cinephile shorts. So visit us on patreon.com slash the Cinephiles. And for me, SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And 
tomorrow we are recording the last episode of the original series on Enterprise Incidents. So if you're a Star Trek fan, definitely check that out. John, how would people find you? Uh, you can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch. Um, where else? Oh yeah, my uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash John Roca says. That's my channel that's out there for people to enjoy the Outlaw Nation. And it's heating up now at the end of the year because of all these films coming out. So there's going to be a bunch of reviews, a bunch of uh, content going on there as well. And my other podcasts, the uh, top 10, uh, the Hot Mike, the Geek Buddies, uh, and Strong Style that are out there for you all to enjoy. So check all of those things out and make sure to come back next week for a brand new episode of The Cinephiles.